So hello everyone and welcome to the last session of the online advanced course on biomedical imaging. So I'm Shala Abib, I'll be supporting this session with my colleague Vera Pintu. This session uh, will be completely English and about proton therapy and we are going to have speakers from the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center as well from the Ger Ger German Cancer uh, Research Center and we're going to end up with presentations of two projects from the UT Austin Portugal program. As you know, you can drop your question in the Q&A, or if you want to raise your questions verbally, you can just use the, rent, use the raise the hand feature at the end of presentations. I hope you enjoyed today's session, and I'm just going to pass the word to Professor Magritte and Professor Sume to welcome our first speaker. Thank you for being here. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here on this last session. Uh, I will present Professor Folk Fonish, which is an associate professor at the Department of Radiation Physics, Division of Radiation Oncology from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston. He finished his PhD in 2003 in experimental physics, in which he, he explored the quality assurance of the delivery of carbon ion therapy at GSI using in bin PET. This project requires both experiment measurements, measurements and Monte Carlo simulations. Since 2009, he has developed the expertise in proton therapy, first as proton fellow and now as a faculty member. While he spends most of, of the time as a clinical physics, physicist, sorry, he also works on several projects related to proton therapy, including quality insurance and the impact of protons on pacemakers. His strong background in research and clinical applications of radiation therapy using photons, carbon and protons gave us the honor of having him today talking about principles and practice of proton therapy. Professor Folk, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, I, I will talk about um, principle and practice of proton therapy. Um, by the way, this is the entrance of our proton therapy center. So why proton therapy? Um, this is the outline. Um, the first step is uh, by proton therapy. Then the second is the general proton system overview our system. Uh, then we, I'm going to talk about uh, proton beam delivery methods, then uh, radiation treatment workflow, including uncertainty discussion, passive scattering beam planning, and scanning beam planning. Um, so why proton therapy? Um, so a long time ago, in 1946, Robert Wills suggested to use proton therapy in cancer treatment. Um, he said that the low entrance dose, those increase uh, sharply with the depth and the rapid fall off after the peak makes it very suitable um, for patient treatment and uh, to spare the normal tissue, treat the tumor in the middle and spare the healthy tissue in the back. Um, I have a little bit of a footnote here. So this is the uh, break peak of a proton. Um, there is no dose in the back, unlike uh, with hadron therapy, where you have some tails here, fragmental tails. And that can be useful, um, need to see um, in the application. So uh, as I said, we spare OAR and we can escalate the dose. So the tumor, however, is not as small as uh, it indicated. So we need to go over from a uh, uh, pristine Bragg peak to a spread out Bragg peak. So we uh, overlaying multiple uh, proton beams with different energies or different ranges with different intensity. And if we do that, we're getting a flat so-called spread out Bragg peak. This can be achieved by either a range modulator wheel. This is a physical device or by varying the energy in the accelerator. Uh, as, as an example, um, the ideal example is a synchrotron. Um, here is a, another slide from our system. So as mentioned, we have a synchrotron. Um, we, we're starting here the beam, then it, uh, it goes into different rooms. We have a total of uh, five passive nozzles and one pencil beam uh, scanning nozzle. That's the one here. 
clinically used are only four beam lines, this, 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 and this. Um, and and uh, this is our put and center one that ha we have been using for many years now. Um, so here on the next slide uh, is the new center. Uh, you can see technical drawings of it. Um, the difference is um, it has only four rooms, but all of them are clinical. All of them are scanning beam. Um, all of them have gantries. And um, then they have different additional features such as CT on rails, uh, surface imaging. Uh, all of them have cone beam CT. Uh, all of them have uh, RTRT system. Um, and here's a picture of uh, of this current status of it. So we want to go live uh, next year, but we will see. Uh, so we are in the process. We are not even in the process of commissioning. Hitachi is still uh, adjusting or gets ready for the getting beam in, but the hardware needs to be set first and then you can pull some wires and uh, make sure that the beam is tuned well. So it's getting ready on this. Um, so here again, back to PTC1. So I can see the PTC2 is an evolution of PTC1, um, the synchrotron. This is also a schematic sketch uh, from a screenshot from our uh, HMI computer. Um, so it, so it's the, the same concept. And you see all the devices involved that has to be switched on in a certain way. So each of them uh, is, a, is a big piece of hardware that does different things, focusing, defocusing on the magnets. Um, and in, this is just uh, a picture of um, how how the flow is. So in the current machine, and you can see actually uh, Gentry one, two, and three is, is has pretty much the same devices. The main difference is inside the nozzle. So again, we're starting out with the uh, for in a synchrotron, we're starting out with linear accelerator. Uh, in our case. Um, it is a seven MeV one. So it's a two stage system. First, uh, we have a, a 3.5 uh, MeV RF tube followed by a drift tube. So here you see both of them together. Um, and uh, actually here, if you're looking from the back of it, um, so it, all of this starts here. It's supposed to be a bottle of hydrogen under it. It's a very small bottle. And then uh, it starts and c goes into the synchrotron. So the Linux again is coming from here, uh, going into the circle, and then uh, the proton rotate in here. And every time they pass uh, this area here, they get accelerated. Uh, the, here you see also the red uh, colored magnets, so to keep the proton in a circle, and then some. Uh, beam focusing as measurement uh, or as well as uh, monitoring devices are here. But so this thing has 14 meter diameter. So there's a little person there. This is the picture during the installation. And an important component of this is um, the RF kicker. It's a very fast magnet that, that, that um, extracts the, the protons out of the wing by a small amount and then the deviating from the normal uh, curvature. And so they're getting essentially scraped off from the wing and few of them make it into the transporting line that's showing here. So the same device again, going in here. And then uh, this is the beam transport and the devices that I showed you before on the screen, each of them is such a device. So focusing, defocusing and uh, yeah, it's all, and all of this is underground. Um, in the in PTC one system, so we are um, um, we, we are like, like two stories under the the, um, the surface. In PTC one, we will uh, PTC two, we will not have that. We will be overground, and so there is lots of shielding here. This is the dirt behind, but um, for the other one, there will be. Um, so the gantry. So the gantry is, is massive. So um, just to give you a picture here, well, inside the room, you saw the picture, uh, maybe not yet, but in the next uh, slide it will be showing. 
this is fairly narrow from compared to, for instance, um, a Linux. But uh, so the dimension in here is not very wide. Um, not sure what I show actually. Let me try on the laser. So the, the, this the dimension here is is very narrow, but the overall dimension here is pretty wide. And to support all of this, um, this is a cylindrical structure. Uh, it it weighs 190 tons. So it it uh, it travels on those motors here. Um, it's actually a kind of nice um, engineering piece. And the size comparison is here a Hitachi engineer uh, for reference. So it can rotate as um, indicated by the FDA. We cannot rotate faster than one RPM. So we can do 60 seconds per revolution. Uh, this gantry, unlike the newer models from Hitachi, rotates 360 degrees. So this is a distinction. Um, our PTC2 will also have 360 degree, and this was uh, very important to us. Um, so Hitachi was able to make uh, for other uh, sites uh, 180 degree gantry and then uh, take care of the rest with the couch rotation. We prefer not to rotate the couch. So we keep the couch uh, st uh, still and um, rotating only the gantry. Position accuracy is half, better than half a degree, and um, there's a counterbalance and also um, a beam block to absorb uh, the neutrons. Uh, the ice center accuracy is per specs less than one millimeter over 360 degree rotation. And in order to achieve that, um, there's some uh, mechanical adjustment on the couch uh, done when the gantry is rotated. Here's the view from, from an inside. Um, so this is one of the early uh, pictures from Hitachi. Um, so here, th this is the gantry. That's a small portion. This is the table here. This is not a robotic arm. This is just um, a drive motor that can uh, moves um, up, down, left, right. And on top of it, it can uh, rotate here. And so it's it's a six degree couch, but we're using only essentially four degrees if you want to see it this way. Uh, here's the caterpillar. So this thing moves left and right. It's very precise, um, but it's also very fragile, unfortunately. Um, so if the it but it happened on many occasions that uh, the gantry moved into the into the device, and then the table is a little bit need to be recalibrated. So. As you can see, this is a brand new picture. This is probably from day one. Um, so this is not uh, how it looks now. It has some dents on it. So it needs to be, uh, it's always a little bit um, reworked on, but um, so that's how it's supposed to look like. Um, so this is about, so this was about the hardware. Now I'm gonna go to the, um, the application details. Um, and this is the beam delivery methods. Um, so um, at PTC1, we have two uh, ways. So this is a kind of a unique thing. Uh, later machines, uh, previous other machines had either only passive scattering or only scanning beam. We have both. So that's actually a really uh, good educational experience. Um, we also had the passive scattering uh, first that this came online in 2006 the scanning beam came online in 2008 and so we could we could learn certain aspects of it and we were also the first one scanning beam beam line in north america um, so i will describe all the details of uh, passive scattering as well as scanning beam um, this includes for passive scattering lateral scattering range spreading uh, field collimation uh, uh, and distal collimation. Um, and for scanning beam, I describe our current method and this will be also the starting method for PTC2. Uh, it's called discrete spot scanning or AKA uh, step and shoot. Step and shoot comes from IMRT. Um, so here is a slide from uh, uh, Michael Goetin and Tony, Tony, Tony Lomax. Um, describing in this publication of how 
uh, passive scattering really works. And um, so the point is there are different devices in the, in the beam path that does different things. And so one of the devices is the first scatterer that broadens the beam a little bit. Then you have a second scatterer that makes the beam more uniform. And then uh, it, it goes on. The range modulator wheel, the reason why they have it upstream is because um, they shifting the range, uh, they have uh, a cyclotron, they shifting the range upstream, uh, not even in the room. So that's the reason why it, it's here. For us, this device is sitting here, okay? So then uh, we have a broad beam that's highlighted here by this figure, uh, evaluation of a lot of poor warfare. Um, then you have the collimator here. We call them aperture blocks. Um, and then that, uh, that blocks part of the beam out uh, according to the shape of the tumor. And then we have a compensator in the back that uh, shapes the, 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 those distally. And so the point was in this presentation is that you have quite a few of these uh, wasted proton. And um, it is probably in the order of factor of 30 amount of what you're wasting. So you have 30 times more proton put into it in order to get the same dose here compared to scanning beam. And this, I come to a later point, the scanning beam. So here again, the, the same uh, figure again. So however, it only focuses on the first portion, the spreadering. Uh, so this call is called, the system is called double scattering. So unlike uh, the first models, they had single scattering only. So they had a different uh, object in the beginning and this looked more like, um, a flattening filter from a linear accelerator. So it actually had a shape like this. So as a result of this, you're getting a more of a flat, but the, the double scattering method has the advantage of um, producing less neutrons, first of all, and makes also the profile more uniform. So therefore scat uh, double scattering uh, was the way to go. This is just a symbolic device. So this is really not looking like this. Um, and then uh, the collimator again, uh, this is not the first collimator inside the nozzle, so this is not this patient specific one. And as a result of this, you can get, depending on what devices, what kind of scatterer you use, you can get different widths. So initially the beam is like a CM diameter and you can make this as wide as um, 25 CM. So you can widen it by a lot. And of course the distance from here to here in our case is about 270 centimeter. So now how do you modulate the energy uh, or the range better to say? Um, the, so I mentioned this before, um, you need to superimpose those, um, those uh, different uh, energies and uh, you need to modify the density at the same time and that's achieved in our case with so-called range modulator wheels. Um, so we have 24 different pieces per gantry. So they look like this. Um, they, they are either made of aluminum like in the picture or they're made of uh, ABS uh, plastic. And that's a function of uh, what is the energy of the, of the beam. So for higher energy, we use aluminum, for lower energies, we use plastic. Um, so of all how this works is the proton beam schematically shown here um, penetrates the first scatterer, that's this piece here. And then it hits the, um, we call it RMW here. And you see there are different steps on it. Um, and then uh, this thing rotates at 400 RPM. Uh, and on top of this, you can see the modulation are six times here or over a 360 degree rotation. So this means we can achieve 40 modulation per second. So it means it's, it's pretty fast overall. And um, the important thing is, um, so the, the respirated motion doesn't play a role. We are much faster than the respiration. So, and those are data for measurements here, just to, uh, to see that's, that certain things are real, uh, not uh, disabnormalized.
PDs. So if you have, so there are two ways of rotating those uh, range moderator wheels. Um, one way is to, uh, to uh, they're spinning at a constant speed, just saying. So then you can keep the beam on all the time and then it modulates, it goes back and forth, back and forth. And uh, the resulting one is a flat SOPP. Uh, however, this gives you only a fixed SOPP. So how do you get different SOPP shapes? So you do this by so this uh, different sizes of SOPP. So one way is creating another RMW, but that would be cumbersome because then the, the, the therapist would need to change the RMW every time they, they have a different field. So, and they have not only 24 RMW, they would have 240 RMWs. So that would be imp uh, impossible to store. Um, so what Hitachi did is they controlling this electronically. So um, what they do is they turn on and off the beam at a certain position. So in one scenario, only along this small axis, the beam is on and in other scenarios, it is uh, longer turned on. And that's what uses different sizes of SLP here in this example, 4CM, 8CM and 12CM. And it, all in common, the, the absolute range is the same, but the proximal dose is a little bit different. So now other hardware devices. Um, so as I mentioned, the RMW. So this is a schematic sketch. Um, again, the beam RMW and then the second scatter. Um, and then comes inside the nozzle that has, uh, Hitachi calls it this way, um, is a dose monitor, another dose monitor, and um, the blocks, the aperture blocks and the compensator. Apparently you see the drawing from Al Smith was uh, with the MGH beam line. They had a, a circular uh, collimator. We have a square collimator that comes at uh, the different sizes, 10 by 10, 18 by 18, 25 by 25, nominal field size. The plus is, is the material, its thickness is 2CM and uh, between two and three identical pieces are used. It, is in, it has a notch on it so that you cannot rotate this in the wrong way. Uh, however, it's not electronically indexed. Instead, it has a barcode, which the therapist have to load uh, every time they, they want to irradiate the field. This aperture goes then together with the compensator, which is made of acrylic. Uh, it has a smooth surface and the thickness can vary typically between two and five, 15 centimeter. So what does the compensator do? So compensator are used uh, in passive scattering to shape the distal part of the dose and also to account for heterogeneity along the beam path. So in this example, um, if I have a collimated field, um, then in water, that would uh, make a plain edge at the end. However, if the shape of the tumor is, is rounded, then the only way to achieve that is by doing um, uh, putting a different material amount here and that uh, pulls back the beam. So now I come to the scanning beam part. Um, so um, this again, the, the publication from uh, Michael Coitin and Tony Lomax, uh, you can see the whole point was although he was promoting this uh, method. So it's a little bit, um, but the point was there's nothing inside of it. The reality is however, there is a lot of stuff inside. So, um, but the point is you have two magnets here and they do everything for you. However, it also requires that the, the beam comes with the right energy. So you do different energies and uh, the magnets uh, um, deflect the beam at different location where you would like to have. And the point was, oh, you have new wasted proton. And as I said, the factor of 30 is typically a, a value that you can keep in mind. So here's an example of uh, how this whole thing is works. Um, so you're delivering the deepest energy layer first, and then, um, then you're adding another beam and another beam and another beam and you're changing the energy. 
Uh, so you go into low energy and delivering all the spots. Um, and then you're painting a 3D volume with this. So here is a drawing of this. And as I said, it's not like that there's nothing in there. There's still a lot of stuff in there. Um, as, um, so this is the this is the vacuum window profile monitor. This is the helium chamber. This is all for uh, PTC one. So this has changed in PTC two. The general items are similar. Uh, there's no vacuum. There's a vacuum tube instead, and uh, there's a, a focusing magnet in between. And everything is a little bit sh shrunk. So here, this is a bit further extended here. And it's also not so much for scale here. This is a little bit schematic. So this is um, shown here. So on top of this, the, what's actually quite interesting is in our system, similar to passive scattering, we have this movable um, X-ray. And TJ uh, in the next talk will probably talk about uh, the IGLT as well. So X-ray is inside the nozzle. That will not be the case for PTC2. Then here we have those monitor one, two, and spot position monitor. Then there is an energy filter, um, but both scattering device and energy filter we're not using for PTC2. And on top of this, we have uh, an energy absorber. It actually calls it this way, and an aperture. Here are the, the specs of the beam line. We can deliver energy uh, or ranges according uh, between four centimeter and 30.6 centimeter. And we can, it has uh, for low energy an increment of 0.1 centimeter to 0.6 centimeter for high energies. The spot size is four millimeter sigma in air and the SAD is about 250. That compares to uh, 100 centimeter in, in, in a Linux. And the reason why it's 250 is because the distance from the ISO center to the center of the, the magnets is about this distance. So that's actually kind of nice, in my opinion, because then the inverse square is a very, very small effect. So what can you do with this scanning beam? You can, um, you can deliver a spot at any location. Uh, you can deliver any energy and uh, here again, the spot size as a function of energy. And the spot size is not the same in plane versus cross plane. However, the TPS assumes that. Um, so how do you create a flat dose? Um, so you need to overlay uh, exactly the same weight to the, exactly the same position. And um, then you achieve a flat dose. However, early on one of the the caution was, um, oh, if you make a spot position error, then you can produce a dose that looks like this. Um, as a footnote, one needs to say, this is true for 1.5 sigma uh, spot distance. We are doing 0.5. So it, it varies a lot how, how your spot spacing is. So our spot spacing is much, much, much more narrow and if you do that, then this has no effect anymore. Uh, the other ad advantage, so this is all with uniform uh, weight of the spot and you get a flat profile, but you can, on top of this, you can improve the penumbra by changing the weight. You're getting the same profile approximately. And although this is determined by the optimizer and the different planning system and your different weights on all the spots and the penumbra is sharper as a result of this. But let's compare passive versus uh, scanning beam. Um, so this is kind of old stuff because um, um, yeah, some of the slides are a little bit older, um, but certain things are still valid. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can say, oh, everybody is going now with scanning beam because it's the new technology. And if it works, then it's great. And, uh, it, and you can say, oh, this is the mature technology. This new technology has also matured now. So all the negatives uh, that we may have here, um, 
may not apply anymore. I still have the slide. So just uh, this is uh, if somebody asks you about it, that's probably still correct here. Um, but um, the scanning beam technology is in 99% of the cases superior to passive scattering. So now I'm going to go over the radiation treatment workflow, um, starting with the, um, so this is the going to all these, these steps and I wanted to uh, highlight all of them um, individually. So the treatment of a patient starts uh, with immobil immobilizing the patient. Um, we using devices such as mask, vacuum cushion, and leg immobilizer to, to make sure that the patient is simulated the same way as he is or he, she is treated. The, this is a CT scan. Um, the, the CT scan images are used for treatment planning and for those calculation. Yeah, I need to, to speed up a little bit. I will um, go to this briefly. So these are setup devices for thoracic patients. Um, this is setup devices for prostate patients. Um, this is setup devices for CSI patient. Um, that is currently uh, in our development, um, uh, what we're going to do. So that's kind of an interesting topic, but let's skip that. Um, so general consideration for mobilization devices. So an important thing is that the WET needs to be the same in the TPS as it is in the CT, or oh, the other way around. The same in the treatment planning system as it is in reality. Um, so in this case, our table has 0.7 centimeter and, um, and we verified that um, and it needs to be on a treatment as well as the simulator. This table is uh, that we currently use, this is our head and neck table um, that has rounded edges. So this would allow you to, to shoot the peep through this uh, without um, changing the WET substantially. Um, and then on top of it, you have these pins where you can put the mask on it and the, the head holder. So the second step of the treatment uh, course is that the, 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 the dosimetrist uh, registers the MRI, uh, which shows the uh, tumor better than the CT does because some of the tumors aren't visible in the CT. Um, and registered that in a treatment planning system so that the MRI picture superimposes to the, to the CT. Then the, then the physician can draw the tumor and, um, and the, then in the next step that the tab, so this is the tu tumor here as an example, this is just, um, I'm not sure whether that's real, it may be real. Then it is, the OER is contacted by the physician as well. And then a plan is generated. So before that, uh, in order to generate a plan by, by the dosimetrist, um, is uh, the physician has to give a, a planning directive and we have a form for that. And um, so they can specify what target I'm, they are treating, uh, what are the organ at risk um, and what is the prescription. Here an example. Um, and, and the second next step is uh, the, the beam selection. So here you have, um, in this case, uh, four beams were selected um, and we need to decide which accessories we're using, uh, energy absorber or aperture, and then um, decide on a target margin. So, but before we continue planning, we need to consider the uncertainty. And so one of the important things is that proton stop. And so, so that is, is a problem for uncertainty. So we can measure the proton range very precisely in water, but what about in patient? So not so quite sure. So what are the sources of uncertainty and uh, the medi 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 mitigation? So the first thing is the stopping power curve. So you have a CT number that you want to convert into stopping power. And that is for human tissue, not for water. So water is always here. It's always at one, zero one, but all the other, you have some, some dots. And so um, while there is a TG, 
uh, report, um, the cheat sheet 202, but uh, Michael Moyer came up with this 3.5%. Uh, and in this uh, paper, he describes how he did that. Um, then this leads to, this range uncertainty leads to large margin, both distal end and proximal. Um, and some of the best features of aiming at beam towards the, the target cannot be used. And this reduces the effectiveness of protons over VMAT. Possible mitigation strategy is improving the uh, accuracy to determine the proton stopping power, reducing the 3.5%, the maybe the 2%, using dual energy or the proton radiography. This is all um, an ongoing thing, PET imaging or prompt gamma. Um, conversely, uh, on top of this, uh, in the TPS, robust planning with or and or margin are suitable. Other uncertainties are CT artifacts uh, shown here. Um, they can be addressed either by MV CT, uh, by artifact reconstruction algorithm uh, to some degree, especially for the soft tissue, or uh, HU or end override. So this is being done um, in our, uh, but this is a source of uncertainty. Then um, the other uncertainties are those calculation. Here uh, shown uh, in case of lung, uh, the distal straggling, uh, to see how old this paper is. Uh, so this is an ongoing thing. At the time, the CT had a different resolution as well. And this had increased over time. So a higher resolution CT will help. And uh, Monte Carlo algorithm do help too. Um, the other sources are position uncertainty. This can be either random or systematic. So random means day-to-day -day variation of a patient that doesn't set up well, or systematic mean our, your machine is off by a certain amount every day. And that's an unavoidable one because in some degree, you don't really know how much it is. Um, or you have to accept a certain value that it is. So you can't get this uh, to zero. The other one is robust optimization uh, to avoid this. So again, robust optimization, however, this time for setup uncertainty, not for range uncertainty. Then uh, for passive scattering, you use smear and aperture margin. Um, and yeah, that's it. Other uncertainty uh, is the moving target. I will uh, go over, the, I will not talk about this because teacher will. Um, then we have um, interfraction um, anatomical changes, such as uh, tumor shrinkage or weight loss. So this can be addressed by verification CTs and plan adaptation. In surprise, you can also address it to some degree with robust optimization. So it seems to be a common theme, robust optimization, the keyword for IMPT. Um, and the last uncertainty that I mentioned here, so probably people can come up with others, um, is the RBE. And so this is currently uh, a thing of, uh, of improvement. Um, that is the, that the RBE is not constant. The assumption is it's constant, but at the very end of the break peak here, so this is the dose here. And um, that is uh, the RBE or the estimated RBE along with this. So, the RBE changes from originally 1.1 or less than 1.1 here to over to over two, almost three in the, in the very end of the range. So this meets to a higher, so in this case here, let's say you have a tumor or you wanna treat this area here and this is your OAR. So this leads in this region to a higher dose to the OAR and so, in this case, this uh, creates a dose volume histogram. This changes the dose volume histogram or makes a lot of uncertainty on this. But this, this should be avoided, either the beam direction being avoided or the spot placement in such a way that, um, that it, it is not relevant. So again, LET optimization this time. This is still very, very new and commercial system don't support this yet, but soon um, uh, the vendor promised us to make this available to us. 
but that was the planning portion. So um, now it comes to the pastoral scattering, so the, the detail of the planning themselves. Um, so pastoral scattering, again, we're using aperture and compensator. Um, so in this case, I have a tumor here, and this is the spinal cord as an organ at risk. And so um, I, what I don't do is I don't point at those or a beam portal towards the cord. So I'm not having a beam that goes this way and points here. I mean, ends here and points towards the cord. I'm not doing that. Instead, we're combining a beam that goes this way with a beam that goes here. And so in one field portal, the cord is shown here is blocked completely, whereas here it's fully open. And so we're getting a, a conformal enough dose and uh, it, this is a safe plan. Um, so how do we do planning margins in uh, passive scattering? Um, we calculating them as follows. Uh, we do setup uncertainty plus penumbra for the aperture. Uh, we do the setup uncertainty depend on the site. It's considered between two and five millimeter. Uh, the beam margin is uh, from 50% to 95%. And we're using a concept uh, uh, that is consistent with the PT PTV concept. Um, so distal margin highlights here. So the beam is coming from this way. This is my target. Um, highlight here in orange is calculating as three and a half percent of range plus three millimeter. Again, this is the, another publication from Michael Moyo on this. Um, and for the proximal margin, we do this a similar thing. The, the difference is only we calculating it not from here, but from here. So this changes the, the margin by a small amount. Uh, on top of this, uh, for, for passive scattering, we can only do an increment of one cm on the on the SOP. So here, this is this is how smear works. So um, this is also a very old publication. You can see how mature the the technology is. So what it does essentially, so you have a an original compensator here, and in, along the beam path, we have different object, and so you need to modify the range based on the the object, and. So what it does is when you're moving left and right, the compensator virtually, you 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 widen the, the widths of the deepest layer. So you essentially thin the compensator. The other, op, uh, the other item is the aperture margin. Um, so we calculating them off the PTV. As I said, the, uh, we use uh, the PTV concept and um, the reporting, however, is a bit questionable. ICRU would suggest to use uh, PTV, but um, yeah, that's fine. We, we're following them, uh, but we ensure with this week ensuring coverage to the PTV. So, um, so here an example for proton uh, for uh, cranial spinal irradiation. Um, so here it's reading from posterior. So there's no beam anteriorly. And uh, then there's a boost section of this in this area. And um, so very conformal, with, and this is all with passive scattering. Here again, we see uh, in range verification from, um, from proton treatment. In MRI, you see the discoloration on the MRI, and this correlates with the range. So scanning beam. Um, Running a little bit out of time, I'm sorry. Um, so the optimization uses the inverse planning method and the planner gives these uh, objectives and can also add robust criteria to this. And the computer uses the maximum likelihood method to minimum the cost function here. So to get the, the shape of the uh, DVH better. There are two different methods. I won't go over this. Um, but uh, in summary, everything is done now with multi-field optimization. Um, that means that all spots from all fields are optimized simultaneously. 
Um, so it allows patch field for complex volume. Uh, it's more versatile and to get a good plan and more sensitive to uncertainty. And uh, robustness of MFO is important. So I won't go to this. Um, so in the next step um, is the plan review by the MD. And he checks the 2D slices, he checks the dose volume histograms, and he compares with the planning directive. However, sometimes our plans don't meet the planning directive, and that's how we have to live in reality. Otherwise, it would be uh, too easy. So here, another example uh, for our patient case, the next step. So after we have done a, a plan, we delivering this plan uh, in, uh, we make a verification plan in the TPS, and then we, um, we measure this same, on the same geometry, this is a rotating uh, 2D detector and with all the devices attached and then we're comparing the dose. And this is showing here with our software, um, comparing the measured versus the calculated dose and then see how they agree using a certain criteria. Then uh, we have, in addition, we have also spot position analysis. And um, this works because the HMI from Hitachi delivers a DICOM file onto the Mosaic PC that is uh, processed with our software. And then we getting uh, spot position information as well as intensity. And this is recorded for every single field for every single fraction. And then um, the delivery uh, comes last. So after all the QA is done, uh, we're del delivering um, this to the patient. And we're typically delivering between 1.5 and 3.7 gray. Yes, they are outlier to this. And also the fraction number are between 10 and 39 fractions. So this can also vary. Um, so in summary, uh, proton have some unique dosimetric uh, properties, which are found to be useful in producing highly conformal dose distribution and target and reduction of dose to OER. And use of spot scanning proton beam has the potential for use dose painting with reduced neutron draws and mitigation of known and unknown uncertainty are essential to achieve the full potential of proton therapy. This remains an active area of research and development. So I, I thank you for, for, uh, for people that, uh, some of them uh, that may make the slides as well as um, my colleagues and physician and uh, dosimetrist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Folk, uh, we have a, a question in the Q&A. Uh, I will read. So in the slide where you talked about treatment planning and the beam uh, angle selection, what did you mean with accessories? And by okay. margin, and by margin, sorry, and by margin selection, do you see different margins for different tumors? Uh, the first question is easy. Um, so the, our accessories are, um, are energy absorber. As I say, if, you, if the tumor is superficial, then we need to put in this, uh, we have our device is 6.7 cm thick into the beam and that pulls back the range and this allows us to treat all the way to the surface. Uh, that's a selection of one device. The other device is the aperture. Uh, but on top of this, since we have uh, scanning beam and passive scattering, sometimes we can choose between those two modalities. So while sometimes you get a good, let's say, a good enough plan uh, for, or even a better plan with passive scattering um, than you do with scanning beam, so you may want to go with that method. So this is the selection of the, the devices, uh, so even the modality, if you want to see it as well. Uh, regarding the margin, uh, so the margins are, so the, the, the setup uncertainties are larger for, uh, so, so for, for treating parts that are lower down the body. For the brain, the fixation is much better. So uh, the, the, the uncertainty is smaller. Uh, the proximal and distal margin, however, uh, are calculated in a similar way. However, there are scenarios where we increase those margins. For instance, we have imaging artifacts on it, or we have um, uh, metal in, in the beam path. 
So this can all contribute to increasing the margin beyond what we normally have. Then the other question or the, the thing we, we currently, or we started using a new treatment planning system we we using in our research um, before it was Eclipse. And there you have the option to optimize both um, setup uncertainty and range uncertainty. And so it's a compounding thing. Yeah, all of us have range uncertainty. Setup uncertainty are, let's say, optional. So in, in, the, in the ideal world, the patient would set up the same way every day, which, which is she or he or she doesn't. But um, at least you can optimize for it. And so this new optimizer with race station is, is a big step for, for, uh, forward. I don't know if there is someone with uh, one more question. No? So thank you very much, Professor Falk, for the excellent uh, presentation. So, and now we, we will uh, go with the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now move on to the second presentation that will be made by Professor Thomas Wittaker. Professor Wittaker is an assistant professor in clinical physics at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. His area of expertise is radiation physics, in particular proton therapy. And today he will talk about image guided learning and delivery of proton therapy. So I ask you for your attention and remind you that you can use the shot or the raise the hand to drop your questions. Professor Whitaker, welcome. There we go. It's like my slides are covering the mute button. How do I unmute myself? Uh, okay, do you all see my screen in big format and not my slide deck? Yes, yes. We yes. See it. Okay, perfect. I figured out the swap button recently. So congratulations to me. Three years into Zoom and I'm finally figuring things out. Um, today I will uh, be talking about IGRT or image guided radiotherapy and uh, managing of moving targets for proton therapy. <clears throat> I'll be taking a, a pretty big simplistic overview of the subject matter. Um, it wasn't completely clear to me um, of what the background of, of everyone in the audience is, so I apologize if it's too simple, um, but I wanted to, to make sure I covered it in a way that was approachable. Okay. There we go. Okay, so the goals of our talk today will be um, to discuss the basics of um, image-guided radiotherapy, and we'll take a deeper look into managing um, tumor motion and then try to pull it all together by looking at some decision, decision tree um, making uh, tools that help you select the right uh, motion management strategy uh, depending on the treatment site. I'd like to acknowledge specifically Xiaodong Zhang and Arshana uh, Gantam, who supplied some images and a slide uh, to this talk, uh, where I took sources from other um, places I've referenced next to the pictures that I took. I'm sure um, Falk already showed you our center, but um, you know we like to show off our babies, don't we? So this is uh, on the left side, PTC one. It's our current center. It's three passive rooms, one scanning beam room. Um, and we typically treat patients from six in the morning to midnight. And then we're in the process of um, releasing our second center. And um, it will be all scanning beam, uh, four gantry rooms. And we will treat our first patient in 2023. So very, very exciting times here in Houston. So let's talk about IGRT. Um, uh, all IGRT and motion management really begins at the point of CT simulation. Um, probably already described to you today uh, was the CT simulation process. 
Uh, but I wanted to point out because um, uh, I wasn't sure if, if most everybody's kind of a radiology background versus a radiation therapy background. Uh, the CT we take for radiotherapy planning has a very different purpose than it, it does for say diagnostic purposes. So when we're taking a CT scan for treatment, we're really trying to construct a 3D model of the patient, uh, both internally and externally. Um, this model will be the basis for a treatment plan. And uh, therefore we need the patient's position to be reproducible day after day at the treatment machine. So we're gonna add a lot of um, immobilization around the patient to um, help them maintain that reproducible position. Some of examples of the immobilization that we use are things like thermoplastic masks to help the patient hold their head still and get their uh, neck uh, angles uh, the same every day and their head tilt the same every day. Um, uh, molds. Uh, that go underneath the patient. So anywhere the patient's body is not, say, in direct contact with the treatment couch surface, we want to go ahead and supply some sort of mold or backlock in order to support that space so that that space is very consistent. Um, as Dr. Ponish described um, earlier, for proton therapy, we're very concerned on um, reproducing the uh, depth from the point the, the beam enters the patient to where uh, its final destination inside the patient needs to be. In order to do that, it's very critical that all of the thicknesses along the beam path are identical every day. And so we need to make sure that we support um, the patient um, in order to make sure that reproducibility happens. Um, this is an example of uh, a leg immobilizer. So um, the base here is actually just your standard kind of knee cushion. But as we go to the base, there's kind of like these uh, troughs or slots that the patient's foot um, goes into to keep them from you know, tilting their feet in different directions and therefore um, changing, you know, maybe their pelvic tilt or something like that. Um, kind of a big scale view of the treatment planning process. Once we have that CT sim, um, we're gonna take the CT and we're gonna put it in the treatment planning system. Now the treatment planning system uh, what it's taking from the CT is a couple of things. Of course, the patient geometry. Um, that's um, uh, kind of maybe one of the more obvious things. But behind, behind just the patient geometry, the HU are acting as a bridge to, um, to define the uh, electron density in the case of photon planning or the stopping power in the case of proton planning. And these are the, the two key pieces of information the treatment planning system is gonna use in order to come up with a um, accurate dose calculation. Um, using those values, um, the uh, dose will be calculated and then the physician will come in and contour the targets as you see here and the critical structures may or may not be contoured by the physician. A lot of times we actually have um, automated contouring done by um, some AI contouring robots, uh, but they're all then uh, reviewed and cleaned up by both the dosimetrist and the physician. The treatment planning system allows you to do that kind of full 3D simulation of the patient such that we can choose what beam angles uh, we want to uh, have our radiation come from. Um, and then the treatment planning system has um, uh, um, some optimizers to help us plan that radiation. And so 
once the targets have been contoured, we do an optimization. Um, this determines the uh, the number of like beamlets in the larger field and the intensity of those beamlets if we're doing scanning beam um, or uh, simply calculates uh, the dose from the passive beam if it's a passive beam. This is also true if this is a photon beam, but in now instead of a scanning beam, we have MLCs that are optimizing the intensity pattern um, of the radiation. Once the, the radiation pattern has been you know, optimized and determined, uh, the treatment planning system then lets you go right visually inspect this voxel by voxel uh, if you would like to. And then we also have a 2D version, uh, the dose volume histogram, which is a cumulative uh, sum of the dose inside a particular uh, structure. And so for targets, of course, we want you know, nice sharp drop-offs um, uh, and full coverage, but then critical structures, we want to see um, you know, uh, as little dose as possible to the structures. Um, and so the physician uh, will take a close look at both of these pieces of information to determine um, if the plan is um, adequate or not. Once we have the plan, uh, of course, we need to deliver it. And so here is a picture of um, one of our therapists uh, setting up the immobilization devices. Uh, so you can kind of see what that would look like in the room. Of course, uh, Dr. Ponish already showed us um, some nice pictures of patients lying on the table, but you get the idea, thermoplastic mask and the head mold, and here's the beam line. Now uh, I'm supposed to be discussing IGRT. So let's start talking about how we actually do IGRT. From the back wall of uh, the treatment gantry, um, there is an x-ray source and that x-ray source can be extended out from the back wall into uh, the plane of isocenter. Uh, also, there are um, imaging panels that come out from the back wall. So this is what it looks like in a proton therapy center, but um, an analogous thing happens in a photon center. Here we have an x-ray source and an x-ray panel that fold back out of the way um, and can be extended at the time imaging is needed. They uh, retract because uh, you may want to say, turn this couch a full 90 degrees. So then we need to get them back out of the way. So it's common for these machines to, to have their imaging systems fold back up. From the most uh, a basic viewpoint, um, starting with the simplest IGR tech, IGRT techniques um, is bony alignment. Here on the left, you see uh, a digitally reconstructed radiograph um, from the CT scan. So this is from the CT scan we took at the time of simulation. And then here's a radiograph of the patient. So this is uh, the first radiograph they took in a, as they are starting to set up the patient. And you can see the patient is clearly not set up in the right position. Right? The clavicles are well below where they're supposed to be. And if we look closely, we notice um, that um, the oral cavity is not aligned where it needs to be. So the next step in the process for the therapist would be to shift this patient image again until these two images agree um, within you know, a couple of millimeters. Uh, they have access to an AP and a lateral for most of their simple bony alignment setups. Now we can take that a step further uh, because x-rays don't show soft tissue very well. Um, uh, you know, uh, typically the first thing would be a bony alignment, but there are uh, a number of cases where a bony alignment is not sufficient. And 
Um, the prostate is our classic example of that. But we can use um, high density objects as surrogates for soft tissue. So in this case, uh, we have gold fiducial markers that are implanted into the prostate. And then uh, once they're implanted in the prostate, uh, they, um, their positions stay fixed to the prostate and we're able to see them on radiographs. Now the prostate will move day to day, sometimes as much as a centimeter and a half, but more commonly about eight millimeters uh, based on the filling of the bladder and the filling of the rectum. And so in order to um, properly treat the prostate, we'll need to make, uh, um, we'll need to adjust the patient's position in order to account for that motion. And then radiographs um, of the fiducial markers uh, let us do that alignment. So in this case, we would ignore the bony alignment and just simply go and localize on the fiducials. Now we can take things a step further. And this is um, now pretty prevalent in most centers to have volumetric imaging on uh, the machine itself. Uh, some centers will use this daily, some will are still using it only weekly and then using daily radiographs. Um, but here you can see the purple is our CT simulation uh, the green is our uh, cone beam CT. And so this is that same image source and same panel. And now we're just gonna take them and uh, rotate the gantry and acquire images as we go. And so we're going to get a cone beam CT from this. And then um, we can do either a soft tissue alignment or a bony alignment, depending on the, um, the anatomic site we're treating. For a prostate, um, this has been you know, really quite helpful because we one of the main issues with treating prostate patients, of course, is the dose to the rectum. And so this has really allowed us to place the anterior rectal wall in the exact same place every day and therefore you know, providing maximal dose coverage to the prostate while doing our best to protect the rectum on a daily basis. Okay, so that was IGRT kind of in a nutshell, a very um, kind of basic overview. Things start getting a little bit more complicated as we have uh, tumors and normal tissue that move. Um, and so let's start talking about the types of motion you might see. Um, so the first is the, the tumor can move, right? Uh, and then uh, there is the case where we have normal tissue, tissue that moves, but tumors that don't. Um, and then we have the motion of the beam. This is true in scanning beam because the, the scanning beam process, um, you know, the, um, it only delivers one beam at a time and then steps to a new position. And so uh, there is a time sequence to the delivery of each beam. And the analogy in the photon clinic would be the MLCs moving to deliver different patterns. Um, that would be the mechanical motion in the photon clinic. And then uh, there is the case in which we want to make an intentional motion, which is maybe we want to have separation between a target and a critical structure. And we'll cover that case specifically as well in the coming slides. I think personally, for me, it helps to have like this kind of big picture clinical view of uh, what motions um, you would expect to see and where you expect to see them. And so um, I always like to think of like where I'm at um, within the abdomen and, and thorax uh, uh, as far as where the treatment site's going to be. So I brought back our, our therapist friend, Chris, and overlaid on top of him a range of motions. 
So right at the level of the diaphragm is where we're going to see the largest amount of motions. And so this is going to affect our lower lobe of the lung and our liver lesions or really anything near the abdomen. And in this area, we can expect to see target motion greater than one centimeter. Now, as we move uh, superior in the lung to say the middle lobe of the lung, it's very common to still see um, tumor motion greater than say five millimeters, but now the chances of getting something greater than one centimeter are becoming less and less as we move up towards the heart. Then as we move um, down in the pelvis, so all the way to the prostate, almost no motion due to respiration. Um, and um, at the level of the periaortic nodes, maybe a little bit of motion, um, but typically these are gonna be less than five millimeters. And then as you move to the very apex of the lung, also typically very little motion, um, you know, something less than five millimeters. Now we have the special, um, the special situation that I mentioned before in which we can have surrounding tissues move significantly, but targets that don't. Uh, esophagus would be a classic example of this. The esophagus um, itself um, may not move very much, maybe on the order of five millimeters, um, but because it passes between the thorax and the abdomen, uh, the diaphragm motion uh, is likely to be in the treatment field itself. And there we're gonna see motions greater than, greater than one centimeter. And so we're definitely gonna need a special technique to handle that scenario. Okay, so let's talk about some of the motion management strategies that we have available to us. Um, first, uh, we are uh, likely to acquire a 4D CT scan um, anytime we suspect uh, tumor motion is going to be an issue. With that CT scan, we're going to be able to make some decisions. Uh, some of the ways we can mitigate uh, the tumor motion is we can just treat a larger volume. Um, we can use gating to only treat during a portion of the respiratory cycle. We can use a breath hold technique in order to have the patient hold their breath and therefore hold the tumor location for a longer period of time. And we can use abdominal compression. I'm gonna go through kind of the pros and cons of each of these. Uh, for treating a larger tar target volume, um, uh, typically, we call this uh, using an ITV or an internal target volume. And let me just briefly, maybe, I mean, I, I assume you guys all know this, but uh, let me just, in, in case, um, briefly describe what these each of these are. Um, the red here is the gross tumor volume. So this would be literal tumor uh, uh, in the patient that needs to be treated. And then outside of that, we have a volume called the clinical target volume. This is all the tissue that needs to be treated in order to give the highest probability of, of tumor control. So this is not tissue that is um, to account for any kind of uncertainty or errors or anything like this. This is actual target that needs to be treated to a particular prescription dose in order to um, obtain the cure we're looking for. Beyond that, if we have something like motion, this whole uh, target may move up and down with respiratory motion. And so we need a space around it that we're gonna treat. We're gonna treat this space, uh, not because the space itself needs to be treated for cure, but because the target is occupying this space and we need to treat um, this blue volume. Beyond that, we have uh, the planning target volume. This accounts for any of our uncertainties in 
uh, motion. Uh, I'm not motion, I'm sorry. Any of our um, uncertainties in our ability to position the patient. Um, and potentially we could account for range uncertainty here as well if we wanted to. Although that's, a, that's actually a little bit trickier. Um, the PTV does not always account for range uncertainty. Um, so um, yeah, so that's what these volumes are. Now, you can see from this diagram, I've made this diagram kind of, you know, elongated on purpose in that if you choose the ITV method, there is significant amount of tissue um, that will get treated that would not need to be treated if there was not a large amount of motion. And so the range of motion really matters um, when deciding to use an ITV or not. If it is much larger than one centimeter, then we are going to end up treating a lot more normal tissue than when we would have to. But as that motion becomes less and less on the order of less than five millimeters, uh, adding just a little bit of extra margin to account for that motion is, is a increasingly good, if not best way to ensure that the target gets covered. Um, the, re the technique is very easy. It's, you know, no extra tools, no extra software, no training is, is really needed to, to use this method, um, which is why it's probably used um, maybe even more than it should be. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind, especially when we're delivering IMPT um, or IMRT, uh, is that we do have to worry about the interplay effect. And I'll go into this a little bit more later, um, but sometimes just choosing a larger volume to treat uh, does not um, solve your problem. In fact, it could um, increase your problems depending on your delivery method. So you do have to take into account the delivery method you're choosing before simply um, using an ITV. Okay, so now we can get a little bit more sophisticated. We can use gating. Uh, gating works by uh, turning on and off the beam depending on uh, where the patient uh, is in their respiratory cycle. Um, you can see here from the diagram, the idea would be, say uh, we decide to turn on the beam um, at exhale. And so uh, these little, um, red boxes would be when the radiation comes on. And we're gonna set some threshold. We could easily put it up here. We could put it up down here um, uh, as to when we choose for the beam to be on based on a, a gating threshold. Um, this is very comfortable for the patient. All they gotta do is sit there and breathe. But we do need specialized equipment. We need a, a method for um, monitoring the patient's breath. Uh, we can use a camera um, with like Varian's RPM system. There's a camera just outside of this picture that is looking at this box on the patient. As the patient breathes up and down, uh, the lung is going, um, you know, superior, inferior. And so we use this box as a surrogate for that motion uh, that we, um, uh, that we capture with a 4D CT scan at the time of simulation. So we need the capability of doing 4D CT scans and we need the ability to um, monitor the respiratory cycle. Uh, there are other methods other than Varian's method. Um, we can use these belts, typically called a bellow, um, in which as the patient um, breathes, the belt is stretched, and a signal is sent um, to the CT scan or the treatment machine um, recording the respiratory cycle. Uh, this method ideally works if your machine can turn off and on very quickly. This is typically true of photon machines, although not all photon machines kind of come up and deliver beam as fast as others. Um, but if the beam does not come out uh, very quickly upon request, then you start 
eating up the, the gated beam on time. Um, and since the patient is free breathing, you know, this isn't a long distance, you know, I just kind of made up this three seconds, but you know, it's somewhere between, you know, five, maybe 10 seconds at the most, you know, patients are not in their exhale phase for um, a really long time um, before they take another breath. Um, so if your machine doesn't come on quickly enough, then this time gets very small and the time it takes to treat the patient becomes very long. The patient becomes um, more and more uncomfortable and twitchy and um, it, it just can be difficult if your machine isn't optimal for this, uh, which is why in most cases it's not, it's not typically an optimal solution for protons because it does take a little bit longer for the proton beam uh, to be extracted and out to the patient. Um, and so, um, you know, this can lead to very low duty cycles um, and then very long treatments. Already, we kind of deal with a difficulty of having enough treatment slots for the number of patients that would like to have proton therapy. As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we already treated our center from six in the morning to midnight. And so um, anything that extends the amount of time it takes to treat a patient is time that reduces our ability to treat more patients, which um, you know, uh, is a benefit to the patients because you know, they otherwise would not be able to get um, proton therapy because there's just such a limited resource um, even, even today. So we have some other options very similar to gating. Uh, there's breath hold and deep inspiration breath hold. Now, uh, regular breath hold is a technique um, used to reduce the amount of tumor motion. So maybe our tumor motions in excess of five millimeters and we need to bring it down to five millimeters or less. So we ask the patient to take a breath and hold it. It doesn't have to be um, a, a super, like does not have to be deep inspiration breath hold in all cases. We really just need to freeze the motion of the tumor um, to extend the amount of time where a label allowed to have the beam on before the patient needs to take a breath. Um, this is slightly less comfortable for the patient because they need to be able to, you know, do a breath hold. Not every patient can do this. Most can, but not every. And so a patient does need to be screened at the time of simulation uh, to make sure that they can hold their breath for at least 30 seconds repeatedly. So we usually ask them to hold their breath. We do it about three times to see if they fatigue quickly. Um, if they fatigue quickly, then we would discuss with the physician a different technique that we might need to use for that patient. Um, it needs uh, all the same equipment that gating needs, but it also uh, needs um, some sort of patient feedback. Uh, there are lots of ways to give that patient feedback, but the most common is a set of goggles that the patient wears and inside the goggles, the patients see a little TV screen and the TV screen shows a bar that's correlated with the, their respiratory motion. And, um, that, uh, and then the patient is asked to hold their breath and hold the bar at a certain location. Um, for deep inspiration breath hold, it's just a subtle change. Now we are gonna take the ask the patient to take as big a breath as they possibly can. We're gonna do that a few times to make sure and see where they can hold their breath comfortably, but as high as possible. And here we're trying to induce separation. This is most commonly used in breast treatments, both in the photon and proton clinics, in which uh, we want to provide space between the chest wall and the heart in order to reduce the dose to the heart. And so you can see the dramatic difference. Of course, this was chosen to be dramatic, but you can see the dramatic difference um, that this uh, deep inspiration breath hold can do in really reducing dose to the heart. And that's one of the biggest issues 
for breast patients is uh, the dose that we give to their heart when we're curing their left-sided breast cancers. Uh, the last option um, that is not used um, uh, as often is abdominal compression. So if a patient is not able to physically hold their breath, um, you can use abdominal compression. Now, uh, this is right out of um, this company's product catalog. Uh, typically, there's some kind of bridge like here that attaches to the table. And there's this paddle. The paddle is pushed down into the abdomen. This is, like I said, a product catalog. And so you can, this does not look uncomfortable. But in reality, when you do this on a patient, you crank this thing way down and you um, um, significantly depress their abdomen such that their diaphragm is not able to move. Um, and in doing so, you can shrink a large motion into a small motion. Um, I find this uh, technique to be uh, very uncomfortable for the patient, uh, but it is effective. Uh, we don't use it typically in protons. It can be used under special situations, but as you can see, there's a lot of equipment um, that provide um, kind of hard edges that uh, the proton beam um, would need to avoid in order to not have some kind of major range uncertainty um, uh, in the beam path. And so we, we try to avoid having this much hardware up and around our patients um, when doing proton therapy. But you can imagine there is a case in which maybe we could treat from the, um, in like um, up from the bottom of the table in which we could avoid all this hardware. Uh, we do use our treatment planning system um, uh, to help us motion management, uh, in motion management strategies. Here's our esophagus case again. Uh, you can see here uh, the large uh, esophageal treatment area um, is going to extend from the uh, thorax to the abdomen. Um, and the diaphragm is going to pass right in the middle of the field. In this case, what we typically do is we uh, plan on the average CT and we uh, override the density of the area where the motion artifact can be seen. And we provide um, a density of one. So we can contour this volume and we can just say, hey, I don't care what the HUR in this space. I want you to give this um, you know, tissue density values. Um, because this is not reality, this is not something that um, will be repeated at the time of treatment, we need to use the power of our CT to evaluate the effect of uh, this motion. And so um, we have, um, uh, we can then take the plan and copy it over onto the zero phase of the 4D CT or the 50 phase of the 4D CT and evaluate the dose distributions in this context. Uh, this is uh, what we're hoping to see, very little change in our target DVHs um, and hopefully not too much change in our critical structures as well. That means we have enough margin um, to keep the target covered, but not too much margin such that we are um, you know, giving a, a lot more dose to a critical structure as the diaphragm moves. Once this is done, the patient can free breathe during treatment if all this looks good. Um, I'm starting to run out of time. I'm gonna cover the interplay effect um, and then you guys can tell me if you want to see the clinical assessments or if you just want to move to um, questions. Um, so anytime we have um, two motions, those motions can interact. So this is what we mean by the interplay effect. Uh, we have a time structure to the tumor motion. So the tumor is moving um, up and down in the patient, superior and inferiorly in the patient. 
Um, and the beam has a time structure because either it has an MLC that's intensity modulating, or it has a scanning beam, which is uh, rastering the proton beam over the target. And it can be that um, when uh, the beam is trying to treat it T0, um, the tumor is not where the beam is at T0, and then it can flip. And so if those are perfectly synchronized, you can imagine a situation where your tumor gets no dose, or you can have the exact opposite. If it's uh, correlated in the other way, you can imagine every time the beam is on, it hits the tumor. And since it was supposed to treat this entire volume and not the tumor each time, you could double your dose. So we can see either that, a doubling of the dose or a halving of the dose. Typically what we see is some weird combination of all of that, <laughs> if it's done in kind of a ex more extreme um, and, um, um, you know, in a, in a way designed to, to show the, the effect. Now, if we can take that motion and we can reduce it to less than five millimeters, uh, typically we're not as concerned about the interplay effect. Um, and if we stretch, um, if we have a large number of fractions, say greater than 10 and a normal dose, again, the interplay effect starts to wash away. But as we reduce the number of doses, number of fractions, which is more and more common, and we raise the amount of dose, it's definitely something that has to be accounted for. Here's kind of an example in a paper so you can see what that looks like. Uh, the static dots are what, um, is the ideal case. They applied gating to make sure that the motion was below five millimeters. That reproduces what they wanted in the static. But if they do nothing, you can see the smearing of the dose pattern. And so that's essentially what you would have um, for the tumor. If you don't do anything to reduce that tumor motion to five millimeters or less. Um, we can, uh, a strategy other than gating, which we use um, uh, quite frequently, is a technique of repainting. And so in the case of repainting, what we do is instead of allowing each spot to say be the maximum spot size it's allowed to be, we now start reducing that maximum amount of MU per spot until um, the spot pattern is delivered multiple times. So uh, the machine will scan through and deliver once and then scan through and deliver again and scan through and deliver again until it gets all the dose in, but it had to repeat that pattern over and over again because we only let it deliver a small amount of dose per spot. Um, how much dose do you need to limit the spot to? Well, you have to do some sort of analysis. and. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Shadong Zhang, um, and um, likely a postdoc of his, wrote a simulator and used real respiratory management um, for DCTs to kind of figure out what should the maximum MU be for uh, PTC in Houston. And this is a machine by machine issue that kind of has to be looked at. And we found it to be 0 0.005. And so that is our maximum MU when we need to implement repainting. And so we'll likely use a strategy where, again, we try to get the motion to less than five millimeters, and then we can put some repainting on top of, of that. Um, and, and, and in that way, we can mitigate the interplay effect. OK. I'm going to, I have a couple of slides which just simply talk about like, how do we make these decisions? Um, and I guess you guys tell me, do you want me to quickly cover these or do you want to just take questions at this point? We, we are on time, we have some time. Um, if you want to uh, just discuss briefly this, uh, sure. this slide. Uh, yeah. We are yeah, I'll walk you through. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
Uh, I think this is one of the, it's, um, we have all these methods, but then how do you, how do you bring it in and how do you really realize it? And um, this is, you know, in, in my opinion, this is um, going through these processes are what really kind of separate out the best institutions when they are um, putting in good um, clinical decision making along with great technical technique. It's not enough to just have technical technique. You have to um, choose how to use it appropriately. And so for most um, uh, cases uh, of motion management, we're gonna start with a 4D CT scan, right? We're gonna take that 4D, 4D CT scan and then we're gonna assess the motion. If our motion is greater than a centimeter, then we know we have to implement some kind of strategy. Um, our go-to in proton therapy, as I mentioned before, is breath hold. Uh, again, mostly because of that duty cycle. Um, it's just very difficult to use gating with proton therapy because it extends the, a treatment for an extended period of time and the patients become quite restless and it's hard to get them through an entire treatment. And so uh, we would then assess the patient for breath hold. If the patient's able to hold their breath for 30 seconds or more, then we would acquire breath hold scans. Uh, we need to do typically about three breath hold scans in order to make sure that the tumor uh, goes to the same place with every breath hold. If they don't, then we can apply an ITV around the range of motions that the patient um, uh, tumor is going to be located in, right? And so now here we're using two different strategies. We're using both a breath hold and potentially we're adding an ITV on top of it because of a range of motion of the tumor itself. Now, if a patient um, cannot hold their breath, um, for 30 seconds and we see tumor motion, then we're kind of in this, okay, let's have a clinical decision. Let's talk with the physician. Let's talk with the physicist and let's determine the best course of action for this patient um, based on a number of clinical issues. Um, and so we kind of step off the graph. Now, if the tumor motion is not greater than a, a centimeter, maybe uh, we can actually just go to planning on the average CT uh, because our motion uh, is already below our certain threshold and evaluate it on both our zero and our 50 phases. So again, think of the esophagus here. In this case, we don't have to implement active breath hold management at the machine, but handle it uh, more passively at the treatment planning level. Um, as I mentioned, uh, for, for breast, um, again, we are going to go through um, a clinical decision making. This time we're going to evaluate chest wall to heart location. If it's a left-sided breast, almost certainly um, we want to implement some strategy to create separation. But a lot of patients, well, more patients than you would think actually have, um, even for left-sided breast cancer, they have quite a bit of separation already between their heart and their chest wall. Um, and so free breathing is, is actually an option, but more typically uh, a patient is assessed for breath hold. And again, if they can hold their breath for 30 seconds repeatedly, we go ahead and we acquire those breath hold scans and, um, and do the treatment plan on the breath hold itself. Um, uh, this, I pretty much covered the esophagus in the other case um, as well. So that's, um, that's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Ponish looks like he's still on, uh, is happy to take any questions if you have them. Um, thank you, Professor Whitaker. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A and also in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you, you, if you can see it, but uh, if not, I can uh, read it for you. Um, I see this now. Yeah, there's uh, the QA section. Um, 
we are typically not present during treatment. So the question was after doing Michigan QA and patient specific QA, do physicists have to present during uh, treatment? That is not often not the case. However, for some special procedures such as prefold, or there are any problems with the setup, um, uh, there will be somebody from physics being present during the treatment. Uh, so that normal thing is not. So we have, however, also uh, disease sites that are really critical, such as uh, spine treatment, where a physicist is always on site, or some kind of stereo treatment, the physicist will be also on site doing every treatment. But then these are hyperfractionated treatments. Um, then uh, this other question, what is the typical dose for fraction for proton for CSI? Um, this is 180 centigrade. Okay, thank you. And there are some questions also in the chat. Um, well, it's quite a mess, but- Yeah, uh, uh, let me grab, yeah, I'll- um... So the question is from Carol Lang and it's how often do you use CBCT during treatment and adjust later irradiations? Sure, so- um... It very depends. So I'm going to talk very broadly, um, you know, photon, proton. Um, it, it very much depends on um, what you're treating. So uh, it is common for prostates to get daily cone beam. Um, and because of that, the reason for that is we really want to set the anterior rectal wall in the same place every day. So in that case, it would be very common. Um, uh, in proton therapy, um, we don't currently have CBCT on our proton therapy machines. It's um, a technology we're getting in our second center. But because we don't have that technology available to us on our machines, we acquire um, verification CT scans on a regular basis. And so we'll actually put the patient, set them up and do a full diagnostic quality CT scan. Um, and then um, decide if we need to adjust the patient. So that CT scan will go and get the plan on it and then fully evaluate it. Um, again, it depends on treatment site. Some treatment sites, it's not very common to need to do anything. Here I'm thinking prostates. It's very uncommon for us to need to adjust a prostate plan um, based on any kind of change. But a head and neck scan is very common. A head and neck patient might end up having three, potentially even five treatment plans through the course of their their treatments. And so they will get anywhere from a weekly verification scan to um, every other week verification scan, depending on how much normal tissue changes we see. Um, if you have CBCT available to you, of course, you can use the CBCT as a trigger. Um, uh, some of the problems you run into in using the CBCT is they're not always good for dose calculation purposes, particularly in the context of proton therapy, the Hounsfield units are just um, not uh, as good as a diagnostic quality CT. And so there's a lot more uncertainty introduced in the scan itself. And then uh, CBCT are much more artifact prone, especially if you, if you think about it, like anything in the abdomen where there's a lot of gas, uh, sometimes the image quality can be quite poor um, and therefore calculating that dose on there is, is hard. So even if you have CBCT in the context of protons, very likely you are taking verification scans along the way in order to decide if a new plan needs to be created. Uh, I think uh, there is another question in the Q&A. Uh, I, I read it for you. What is the typical dose fractionation for proton therapy for uh, CSI? Uh, uh, Dr. Ponish covered that 180 centigrade. 
Uh, okay, sorry. Um, okay. I, I have, I have so also... maybe he means the not the dose per fraction. I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah. How many fractions? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get this initially. So uh, the standard one is uh, twenty three forty. So okay. I don't know how many fraction this is. Uh, we need to do the math. Um, sometimes we also go with the 36 squares, so in 20 fractions. So th those are the two uh, typical fractionations. Uh, one thing I, I noticed on TJ's slides uh, regarding mitigation of um, interplay effect, I may want to add uh, one thing we have implemented uh, at PTC1 is, when it is very easy to implement, is to change your scanning direction. So for scanning beam, you can scan as so your priority scanning direction. And our scanning direction or our scan is really fast. So one spot is delivered within like three milliseconds. So this is much, much faster than the motion of the tumor. So in, in, on this time scale, the diaphragm freezes. If this is the case, then you can scan, if you're scanning along this direction, then uh, you're, you're minimizing the interplay effect. And this is what we do. So, um, and so this comes free, it doesn't cost us anything, so. Okay, thank you. Maybe you cover, uh, but uh, I miss it. Uh, what is the typical duration of a proton therapy session? Um, it, it always depends. On yes, um, <laughs> it always depends. It's very dependent on uh, each site as well. So um, uh, for us, anywhere from thirty minutes to forty-five minutes is the time okay. slot we give a patient. Now, if you have a center with only a single proton room, things go much faster. So remember, we have a single accelerator that feeds multiple rooms. And so oh, okay. if you have more and more rooms, the more amount of time that the beam has to be shared with each patient. So um, the total treatment time could be on the order of 30 minutes to even an hour, depending on what's going on in the clinic. The actual beam on times are not a, a huge part of that. Most of that is patient setup and um, waiting for the beam to come to you. Falk, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, we have currently at PTC1, we, we have the benefit of using passive scattering. And so passive scattering beam delivery for field takes about a minute. And so, um, and for scanning beam for prostate, it takes about a minute uh, beam on time per field. Uh, however, for head and neck, it takes two minutes. So, it, it's three times the time for passive scattering compared to passive scattering, which means if you have all scanning beam, the, the difference may not seem much, but the multiplying it by four, four times three is 12. So this is 12 minutes of beam on time. And that's gonna be in half an hour time slot. So you're starting to back up everybody. So then you're just waiting, 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 waiting. Everybody is waiting. Okay. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Professor Whitaker, and thank you, Professor Bowenish, uh, both for your nice presentations and for covering all the details of proton therapy. Uh, I think we have now a, a break. Isn't we just it? received two. We do have a break, but we just received two questions. I don't know. Uh, if... Oh, sorry. We want to address them very quickly. Um, so the question I can read them, it's how do we decide the way of treatment after proton therapy? And the second question is, is there any treatment scope for patients who go through proton therapy? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand. Um, what does it mean decide the way of treatment after proton therapy? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> Sorry. Any any chance to rephrase that? Um, I can see. If like it's... between scanning beam and passive beam. Um, I can um, ask on the chat. Okay. <laughs> if the person can rephrase that. 
what about the second question? Is that more clear? Uh, is there any treatment scope for patients who go through? Um, so uh, how do they decide if they're going to get proton therapy or not is the way I'm going to read that. Um, there are um, um, a, a lot of times, unfortunately, in the United States, a lot of things are def decided by insurance companies um, and not necessarily on medical grounds. And so sometimes it's just the insurance company chooses where you're, what they're going to pay for. And that's just an unfortunate reality of living in the United States. Um, the uh, um, other sites have shown significant advantages to tissue sparing um, for proton therapy. So the absolute classic example is the CSI in a pediatric patient, right? Um, the amount of radiation given to the rest of the body is, um, is almost non-existent in um, a CSI patient compared to to the photon treatment in which the whole breast tissue, thyroid, cardiac um, structures are all getting significant amount of dose. And then these kids are gonna go on and live um, all their life and um, you know, uh, have significant um, you know, side effects from the radiation. So from a pediatric standpoint, you know, it's like, I don't think there should be any kids being treated with photons personally, but. Um, and then, you know, we're getting more and more evidence of things like uh, head and neck cancers. Um, uh, so you can think if it's a unilateral head and neck cancer, um, we can very significantly um, uh, protect the contralateral salivary glands with almost no radiation, um, most of the oral cavity. And so the patients do much, much better um, under proton therapy than they do photon therapy. They don't need as many peg tubes or like a feeding tube. So a feeding tube is a common thing to need if you're a head and neck patient because like your whole head and neck becomes ulcerated. Uh, internally, your mouth gets ulcerated and it's hard for you to swallow. So then you need a feeding tube. Um, patients uh, often at a higher rate than you would think refuse to finish treatment. So they'll go through all the process and then stop treatment because they just, they can't take how much pain they're in by swallowing and they don't, they're having to use their, their feeding tube, they don't like it. Uh, and so they'll forgo their full treatment and really risk not curing their cancers because they didn't get enough radiation. And so protons in the, that context, because it's much more easily tolerated gets a lot more patients all the way through their treatments and has a significant advantage. Um, so there, there are cases like that where there's like clear, well-known um, advantages to um, being able to spare um, certain tissues and that making all the difference in the world as to whether one, the patient gets a cure or finishes and completes treatment and whether they have side effects in the long run. So you kind of got to take it disease side by disease side. Other things are like simply harder to do. Um, you know, stereotactic lung treatments, they're actually pretty hard to do. And it's hard to beat a photon machine. Not that we're not trying. Um, I mean, we don't do stereotactic lung, but you know, a lot of research is put into like, can we do stereotactic lung proton? Um, because, you know, maybe we can optimize things and get um, more biologic effect into a tumor um, by using a proton that has a variable RBE. But at the same time, the fact that photons are insensitive to all these density changes make them a very, you know, a, a great, great choice for hitting small lesions in a lung. <laughs> so... You know, there, there are uh, pros and cons to each modality. Thank you. So regarding the first question, we just got an explanation in the chat. So what the person meant is how many minimum fractions should we give to patients? And after fractions of therapy, what's the method of patients follow up? 
Sure. Uh, the patients are followed up after treatment for a period of time by their care team, um, often for years to come, um, to just you know monitor and see how well they're they're doing and what their side effects are if if they have them. Um, the number of fractions uh, is very dependent on the cancer itself. Um, some cancers uh, really want to be treated with a large number of fractions in order, like they're pretty sensitive in the first place. And so you want to, um, you know, you want to treat them with as many fractions so that the normal tissues can be spared as much as possible. Other things can be quite radio resistant. Um, things like melanomas, uh, they like to get a pretty hefty dose. Um, so, you know, you want to hit them pretty hard if you can. And then it just depends on what the, what the data supports. And so at MD Anderson, we're very data driven. And so before we will change from one treatment paradigm to the other, um, we will uh, do full blown scale trials on each of these to see what's the right fractionation to treat a certain disease. Um, you're seeing um, things like prostate cancer, which, you know, we, um, you know, MD Anderson was instrumental in determining like, oh, like we need to treat this with 44 fractions um, uh, to almost 80 gray in order to cure these patients. And that was a huge, like a huge win for prostate cancer. Right? We, we hardly remember, but like people used to, like tons of people died of prostate cancer until we figured out we got to get all the way to 80 gray. And the only way to do that was to do it in 44 fractions. Now, as we've gotten some more sophisticated delivery techniques, we're looking at it and going, oh, well now, yes, we need that biologic 80 gray, but now we can start safely giving that in shorter and shorter number of fractions, such that um, there was a trial um, a while back that showed, you know, we can probably do as few as 26 fractions and get that same level of cure with the same kind of critical risk level. But you have to do that for each disease site. So it's not a, you know, it's not a modality basis. It's really a, what is your treatment technique allow you to deliver in a single fraction uh, as far as critical structure sparing? And then um, has there been enough trial evidence to show you that's safe? Um, I, there's a ton of prostate cancer. So it's very easy to do a trial and get the numbers you need. But you can imagine if you have a rare tumor, it's really like, like really hard to get enough data to make smart decisions. And you're risking people's lives when you're monkeying with this stuff. So um, you, you do have to be quite, quite careful. Yeah, TJ, since you mentioned disease sites, I want to add um, at MD Anderson, uh, the physicians are specialized in their service. Yeah. So we have um, so we have the services that treat only a particular disease sites, just as so they are physicians that only treat breast, only treat uh, prostate, etc. So um, so therefore, it also to answer the question. Uh, the follow-up depends also on the service. So some service, they have a long follow-up, some they have a shorter one. And this again, depends on what is the, the chances of recurring a, a, a patient, a tumor. So uh, for breast, uh, they, they also transition the patient after five years as an example into, uh, not they even call them cancer survivor, which in my opinion is a little bit too, um, too hot, um, but they 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 putting this patient in a different category so that they not uh, that they even don't see the MD anymore. Now we are going um, to see the presentation of Professor Juan Sik. Professor Juan Sik is a professor of physics uh, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the Heidelberg University, and he is the group leader of the Biomedical Physics in Radiation Oncology Group at the DKFZ German Cancer Research Center. His current research interests are 
to develop novel imaging technologies to reduce the Bragg peak positioning uncertainties for ion beam radios, radiotherapy using helium beam imaging and prompt gamma spectroscopy, and also to investigate the mechanism of radiation triggered DNA damage via reactive oxygen species. Unfortunately, he won't be able to join us in real time, but we will share his recorded presentation. And uh, if possible, he will jo join us at the end of the presentation to answer uh, the questions. And if it's not possible, he will be available to answer all your questions by email. So as usual, ask your questions in chat or Q&A. And uh, let us now listen to his presentation entitled Towards Real-Time PGS Band Monitoring in Proton Therapy of Prostate Cancer. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will be talking today about real-time prompt gamma uh, range monitoring in proton therapy for prostate cancer. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizers of the biomedical imaging course of 2022. Um, and uh, in the end of this recording, you can uh, submit your questions or comments that you have on the talk, and then I will be forwarded this information by email that I can respond. All right, so let's start. So what, why particle therapy? Why is it so important? Well, one of the main reasons is the Bragg peak. So here's an example of a Bragg peak where you see the tumor in blue and the organ at risk in orange. And you see the Bragg peak represented in red. So the big advantage of the Bragg peak is in fact, its ability to spare the organ at risk to, or, to radiation. And this is what is called the organ sparing region. Right? And that's how we would, that's the main advantage of using proton therapy or any form of particle therapy. In reality, when we treat patients, we don't use one Bragg peak, we use a, a mix of Bragg peaks to produce what is called an SOBP, spread out Bragg peak. And this produces a uniform dose distribution that covers the whole tumor. Now, what are the main problems when we treat proton therapy or particle therapy is what we call uncertainties. So on the left side, you have a case of a, of a radiation beam, a particle beam in yellow that is coming from the left. And because of the range uncertainty that we have, uh, we really have to usually extend the margin. So what we call establish a new safety margin to guarantee that we can treat the tumor due to uncertainties that we might have. So this is one of the problems that the Bragg peak has the so-called range uncertainty and we have to extend the margin to, to treat the whole tumor. An alternative way that is used in all proton therapy and particle therapy is instead of using the direct beam onto the organ is we have used a, a, the lateral edge of the, of the beam. So we use a beam that's coming in parallel to the organ and not orthogonal to the, to the organ. In this case, we use a much broader lateral fall off of the beam and there, uh, it's, the range uncertainty is no longer affecting the position of it, but because of this broader um, lateral fall off, we put radiation directly into the organ at risk. So what are the main disadvantages of the range uncertainties? Well, if you have undershoot of the tumor, you have the case where the tumor is not receiving sufficient radiation, so you're under treating the tumor. And an alternative situation is if you have overshoot, then you go straight into the organ and you produce um, high radiation damage in the organs, so damaging the OR. And there you can have severe side effects from your treatment. Both undershoot and overshoot are affected by many things such as stopping powers, patient alignment positioning, anatomy changes that have an inter and intra diffraction, and of course, organ motion. These are all parameters that affect the position of the Bragg peak. All right, so here's an overview of the talk. Uh, I've divided it into six sections. I will start with the overview of the Bragg peak range uncertainty problem. I'll go into the motivation of range imaging. Then I'll discuss all the range imaging technologies out there. And then I will focus directly on the technology that I've developed, which is the prompt gamma spectroscopy system. And I explain how that works. And we'll focus specifically on timing and energy of the detecting system. Then I will try to describe while the synchrotron is a continuous beam. And then later I'll apply prompt gamma to prostate cancer. 
All right, so here's an example of a, a, a random uh, tumor that's in the brain. And you have in blue the tumor and the brainstem is a highly sensitive organ that's sitting right next to the tumor. And if you want to treat that patient, you would potentially use a beam coming in straight in. So here is your beam with radiation coming in and you want to treat the patient. And on the right, you have what we call um, the clinic. And here we have the example of an organ. Organ A represents this brain stem, and there could be potentially an organ B sitting next to it. In reality, because of the range uncertainties, we always have to expand this margin around the CTV. And that margin means that I shoot radiation on purpose into the organ A to guarantee that I can treat the whole CTV. And what does that mean? I put full dose into my organ at risk, which is my brain stem. I am consciously giving it full radiation. How do I do these expansions into the planning target? Well, there's a variety of range margins recipes out there, and they usually increase with depth. So here is a range margin recipe where you have the depth of the range of the proton ring in centimeters on the x-axis. And in the y-axis, you have the additional margin added in millimeters. So for example, a tumor that's 10 centimeters deep, I need to give between four to six millimeters of margin additional. And as the tumor gets deeper and deeper, the margin literally increases linearly. So these range margins are different range margins available in different centers. For example, MGH Boston has 3.5% plus one, one millimeter, and other centers have a variety of range margins. So what is the distribution of the tumor sites that we treat? The majority of the tumor, around close to 90% of the tumors are, are 10 centimeters or deeper. And here on the left side, you see the distribution and they are uh, different colors. The blue represent brain tumors, the red represents thoracic tumors, and the green represents uh, abdominal tumors. And you see most of the tumors which are abdominal are the ones that we have to treat. And these are very deep, between 10 centimeters and deeper. All right, so what, are the, what, what is the motivation for range monitoring? So the motivation is we want to reduce the margins. That's one of the things. So the safety margins play a very big role in side effects. So we want to reduce this. We also want to de decrease the NTCP. So that means increase the tumor control and reduce toxicity, which is the decrease. It's also very important from a quality assurance that we want to uh, have an easier system to manage. And finally, if we can control the beam, then we can control uh, which directions to use. And in many cases, we can use new directions for treatment. We can have a beam coming straight onto the organ instead of taking a lateral beam. So what is the goal? The, the goal is to achieve range monitoring that allows us to have a very small margin in the order of one to two millimeters. And this would reduce significantly the radiation that goes into the critical organs that is very close to the tumor. So here's an example. The key point is the Bragg peak offers this ability to do that because if we have a fall off, which is very, very sharp, then we have a very increased uh, ability to control this edge here. While the lateral fall off is very broad. And so we usually have a side effect of putting significant radiation into the organ laterally. All right, what are the range monitoring technologies out there? Well, there is a variety of range monitoring technologies. There's the implantable markers, there's proton radiography, MRI, PET, ion acoustics, and prompt gamma, which is the one I focus on. And they have a variety of benefits. Some of them are online in real time. So implantable markers, proton radiography, ion acoustics, and prompt gammas are real time. Some of them are non-invasive. Again, prompt gamma comes in as non-invasive. Commercially available, only a small amount of them are commercially available, the MR and the PET at the moment. And expected accuracy, the most the, the system that is expected accuracy with the highest is potentially the prompt gamma. So I'm going to focus directly on this prompt gamma in the rest of the talk. Before I get to that, I have to explain what it is since this is a teaching course. So let's start with a simple proton or ion beam that's coming in. If the proton hits the nucleus of a target element, this nucleus can be anything from oxygen present in the medium or carbon or even nitrogen. The nucleus gets either excited or uh, and in this ex excited residual nucleus you can have also a knockout of nucleus and when this excited nucleus uh, de-excites it releases energy and this energy is related to the nuclear decay of the of the energy and you have a very unique gamma coming out from the nuclear decay of the of the excited nucleus and this is what you we call the prompt gamma rays they are de-excitation of your nuclear shell 
Okay, how do we use it for patients? Here's an example of a beam coming in, in red, right? We have a specific trigger to say the beam is entered into the room and it hits somewhere in the tumor. It will hit some element of the tumor, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, whatever. And this tumor will then emit, this excited element will then emit these gammas and you detect them at a certain angle at 90 degrees, for example. So here is your detection, detection system, which is blue and green, or here represented in the red. And what you do is you position your detectors orthogonal to the beam so that you can measure very accurately where you want it to be. So for example, here you have an orange line, your bracket peak, and you're measuring all the gammas that are coming at 90 degrees. In reality, it's extremely complicated to measure this because the majority of the signal that is coming is not ideal signal, what we call noise. So you have a problem of signal to noise ratio. And so I usually define this uh, searching for a needle in a haystack and what, what is the haystack and what is the needle? So the key point is here's the beam, the Bragg peak. Here's an example of a water phantom. Here's my detection system where I have my primary detector and additional detectors here. What I want to measure is these prompt gammas that come straight from the medium into the detector. These are my prompt gammas that I consider my uh, key elements, my signal. But I have a, a huge amount of signal coming in from interactions where they leave the detector. So this is now we, something that we have to reject, the green one we have to reject. We have also additional signal coming in from interactions in the collimator, and we have also additional signal coming in from interactions in the medium. So all these three greens have to be removed. That is our background. And then you also have additional signal that comes from the shielding wall all the way around the patient and the detection system. So the red one represents, for example, neutron activated gammas, which happen to be either from the collimation system or the shielding wall. So both the green and the red is the haystack, and that's what we have to remove. And our needle is this little blue line, which is the key element that we, what we want. So how do we do that? We use one property that is important, which is time of flight. So we have a very good understanding of the timing of the pulse. So this uh, blue represents the, the blue signal that was here, the primary. The green one represents all the background noise that we have to remove, which is all the scattered photons, and the red represents all the neutron activation gammas that we also have to remove. And the good thing is we have a very unique pulse right in the beginning, which is our primary. You see that it's very direct, and that usually happens within a few nanoseconds of the emission. So here we have the blue one, which we want. We apply a timing window that shields everything, removing the red. And then we still have a problem between the blue and the green. And that is usually done through energy selection. So on the right now, we have an energy spectrum for different materials, which are targets. These are very unique energy lines for the peaks, representing different interactions with the protons hitting a different medium, for example, hitting oxygen, hitting nitrogen, and so on. And you see these unique peaks uh, give us a unique opportunity to separate the blue from the green. And if you put these two curves together, you get something that looks like this. On one axis, you have your timing. On your other axis, you have your energy. And you can clearly see the signal that you need, which are these little red dots. So the little red dots is the property of your prompt gamma that you... All right, so let's start with different types of particle accelerators, which is what we're going to uh, model. Cyclotrons and pulsed beams are usually uh, are very common in radiotherapy at the moment. More than 70% of all proton centers are cyclotrons based. And what is a cyclotron? A cyclotron has a very fixed pulse system, pulse structure system, where they meet protons every 9.4 nanoseconds. And the pulse structure width is roughly one nanosecond. So every 9.4 nanoseconds, I have one tiny pulse of one nanosecond. So the cyclotron accelerates these bunches at roughly 106.3 megahertz, which corresponds to this 9.4 nanosecond period. And the clinical beam roughly transmits 100 protons per bunch. So each bunch in red here is roughly 100 protons. So we need the fast electronics to really to be able to see every 100 protons. But after that, then we have to wait 9.4 nanoseconds until the next bunch. So the first system I designed and built was in Boston at MGH, the cyclotron system there. And here is an example of the treatment gantry head and the motorized phantom that is over here. The beam is coming in from the left, hitting this phantom. Here you see the collimator that we designed and you see the detection system right here. This is the scintillators, photomultiplier tubes and the voltage, plus all the electronics sitting back on the here and here is the readout system. All right, so 
what we saw is we saw uh, multiple peaks for different energies. So like I said, we have different energies for different decays and each energy produces a Bragg peak in itself. So you see all these different lines represent one energy of emission from one material. <clears throat> and on the right, you have the different materials telling you which lines are being produced. So the, the most important one, for example, is the 6.1 MeV, which is um, this orange one here. And that comes from oxygen, the reaction of the proton with the oxygen. And in the case of the carbon, we have the 4.4 MeV line. And again, it represents the, the reaction of protons with oxygen leading to a carbon emission. And so you see that you have all these peaks for different energies, which you can characterize for each reaction. <clears throat> and how do we measure this then? We just need to acquire two points. We acquire a point just before the Bragg peak and one point just after the Bragg peak. And then to know exactly how much distance is from the red to the Bragg peak, we just calculate the ratios of all these lines. <clears throat> so it's relatively easy now with two points, I can very accurately measure this Bragg peak which is really what we want. We want to know exactly where in the patient is this Bragg peak, but with the, all these energy lines, I can very accurately measure it within a half a millimeter. So we showed that already in Boston uh, five or six years ago, that we can very accurately measure range shifts of 2.3 millimeters or even better. So here's, for example, uh, a depth dose <clears throat> where you don't have any shift in blue, and then you have a 2.3 millimeter shift, and you can clearly see the shift here between the two lines that we measured very accurately. <clears throat> so we've achieved sub-millimeter accuracy. In fact, this is just an example of a shift of 2.3 millimeter. What was the big shift when I went from a pulsed beam to a synchrotron? <clears throat> so the cyclotron to synchrotron shift was basically the change in the scintillator. Lanthium bromide was the first system I designed in Boston. The second system was based on cerium bromide, and there is a big reason because of that, and the reason is lanthium bromide is radioactive, and so, and cerium is not radioactive, so lanthium is that radioactive, cerium is not, and that means I have a significant reduction in noise. So the background signal of cerium bromide is 100 times better. So you see the, the lanthium bromide is this middle curve here, and you see the ratio of a close to 50 as it drops in noise. So I have a significant reduction in noise of a factor of 50 because of the lanthium. Remove, once I remove the lanthium and I put it with cerium, I have a significant lower background, which is really important for reducing the so-called effect of noise. Here's the system I designed and built in Heidelberg. Uh, now we have a beam coming in from the left and this beam can be anything from uh, uh, protons to carbon ions. And these are different energies we investigated. And the targets can be anything from water to plastic, titanium, and aluminum. So we tried a variety of elements, uh, standard tissues in, in patients, or implanted tissue elements like titanium or aluminum. The, also, the big problem of the HIT facilities, because it's a continuous beam, we had to design a very unique trigger, which would sit in front of the beam here. And you can see it right here, trigger. This is the trigger. And the two detectors are these two little uh, serum bromide systems here. So the trigger was the key point to telling us that the beam has entered the room. And, and this is important because now we need to know exactly uh, when the beam enters to know the timing difference from, from the trigger to the uh, detection. So we tried different types of triggers. We tried a plastic scintillator and we tried scintillating fibers in both cases. And we ended up going for the last one, the scintillating fibers as the best system for, for what we were doing. So here is what we see from the trigger. We see a pulse structure that is continuous, but you see these pulses have a variety of signal, right? And, and this, when you look carefully at each one of these pulses, you can either see double hits or triple hits or even single hits. So he has a single hit of a particle that hit the trigger. He has a double hit of a particle that hits the trigger and he has a triple hit. So we had a very fast trigger that allowed us to see all the different types of uh, hits on the trigger. And this was done for both carbon and protons. So this, these results represented here for carbon. All right, so now the, the key point is, how do we deconvolve the information? So here is the signal that we observed um, in the uh, cerium bromide. <clears throat> and you see the primary signal is here, the red one, and you have all this additional background that you have to remove. You have the fast fragments uh, that are coming in before, and you have the neutron and induced gammas that you need to remove. And this key signal that you want, which is the prompt component, is this uh, tiny little red peak here. 
All right, so here is the spectrum that we observed for uh, protons versus carbon. So in red is proton and in carbon is in blue. So the first thing you notice is that the, car the, the protons have a very strong uh, peaks in the high energy. So 6 and 4.4 are very strong for protons. That means I can really look well at oxygen content inside the medium. In the case of carbon, these peaks are suppressed. They're a little lower than carbon, but the, the advantage is that in the low energy, I have a high blue peaks. So you see a shift from uh, low Z element hydrogen to carbon. You see a shift in the size and shape of the peak. So the protons focus provide high intensity peaks in the high energy, while the carbon produce high intensity peaks in the low energy. And when I mean low energy, I mean around 700 kilovolts. And you see here, close to 1.1 kilovolts. You see the kilo electron volts. You see the two, the blue peak is dominant here. So this is one of the big shifts that allowed us to, uh, we, we allowed us to study. We saw with the prompt gamma that there is a change in the height of the peaks. And that was very specific to the mass of the particle that's coming in. We also study the effect of adding um, titanium, which is, for example, a metal and implanted metal into the system. And we see very clearly the effect of the titanium. The, the titanium produces additional peaks and you see them here at 1.8 MeV. You see them also here at 1.38 and 1.09. You see these are the titanium peaks. So we clearly see the impact of materials inside the, inside the, the patient, uh, the fountain, sorry. So this is one case where we used carbon and we could also use it uh, with protons. So here's the system that we envisioned in PGS for, for the HIT facility. We would have a beam coming in from the left, and we have two beam lines for prompt gammas, which we would be acquiring. So the yellow lines represents where the prompt gamma is going to come out, and our detection system would be here. And we have a rotating semi-arc in which the system can be brought closer to the patient or further out, and they can also be focused onto different points here. So the final thing is we... Uh, tested the whole system for prostate cancer more than a year ago, and the results were published in two papers, which I will mention. So what did we do? We took a situation of prostate cancer. We have different types of beams. Usually prostate patients use, receive lateral beams at 90 to 70 degrees. But once you can control really well the Bragg peak, you can rotate these angles at any angle you want. So, and the, you can see the simple rotation here. So one possible way to reduce toxicity in the rectum, that's one of the big problems of the lateral beams, you see the rectum here is receiving full dose, is to use different types of uh, spacers. So one way is to use a hydrogel spacer between the prostate and the, and the rectum, which occurs here. An alternative way is to use a rectal balloon, which goes into the rectum and loads up with water. So in the prostate uh, cancer, we investigate rectal balloons with prompt gamma. <clears throat> And what we did in the case of the rectal balloons, and he has the paper that was published, we filled the water balloon uh, with, not with water, but with the silicon oxide. So instead of having water in this balloon to separate the, the rectum from the, uh, the anterior rectum from the posterior rectum, we introduce a com component of silicon oxide. And silicon oxide has a very unique of silicon at the zero at 1.78 MeV. So this would be a really big advantage with the silicon, we can really know uh, with prompt gamma where it is. So here's, for example, the peak. So when you observe the peak in the, in the, in the beam, you see clearly a peak here, the 1.78 MeV, which is this blue line here. So the difference between using water and, and silicon oxide based medium is that we see a difference when the beam is inside the silicon oxide. Right? And that means that the beam is, beam is overshoot, overshot into the, into the rectum. So this is really not a good thing. So the, the higher the peak, the worse the beam is. So here's an example of a prostate cancer patient, that, a phantom that we used. Um, here is the prostate. You can clearly see the prostate. Here's your rectal balloon introduced. And you see the balloon inflated with liquid. And it's separating the uh, posterior wall of the rectum and the anterior wall from the prostate. So this model, uh, phantom model, we, we bought from CRS. And it, it's very helpful for us to position everything clearly. So here is the beam coming in through the prostate into the rectal balloon. You can see here, this yellow dot means that the beam has gone into the balloon. And you can see, for example, here, uh, for example, you have your, your prostate there. So you see that clearly the beam is overshoot, and this is an undershoot of the beam where there is no signal. And that is represented in these peaks. 
at very high peak, you mean you have a very clear overshoot into the rectal balloon. And once there is no peak the, the, uh, of, this, of the silicon, you see that there is no beam into the rectal balloon. <clears throat> so you can clearly see that the height of the silicon oxide tells you very clearly that the beam is in the rectal balloon or not. So you can control the height or the range of the bright peak. So the height basically tells you exactly where the peak is. <clears throat> So <clears throat> what we did is we also investigate different spots uh, distributions to understand how to best cover the, 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 the prostate and from different angles. So we tried oblique angles. We also tried interior angles. And uh, we always studied different angles and different positions of the, of the, of the proton beam. So this <clears throat> method allowed us to, to do real-time monitoring of the Bragg peak by using a rectal balloon, but you could also use a spacer. So you could also put the spacer that separates the rectal wall from the prostate and you can fill the spacer with silicon oxide. It's relatively easy to do. And you could use also the spacer uh, with prompt gamma to control very accurately the proton beam. So <clears throat> to finish my talk, what we've shown is that prompt gamma has demonstrated the first time uh, at the synchrotron facility in HIT in Heidelberg. We are developing a prototype for clinical for clinical use in Heidelberg, uh, initially for different sites, but potentially first for prostate. We are also uh, able to do uh, single particle resol resolving uh, with bunches, and we can really measure the microstructure of the beam. We also observed that our system provides very accurate variations in oxygen and carbon content inside the target. And this was really excellent from, from a, pers a detection perspective. And finally, we've shown that prompt gamma can be used for monitoring real time the range in prostate cancer. Okay, that's my final slide. And I wanted to acknowledge all the group that is involved at the time. My, my postdoc, Paul Martins, was the, the one that developed most of the work jointly with Ricardo Dalbello, who was my PhD student at the time. <clears throat> they did a lot of the work, which is, uh, was shown in the work published. And recently, uh, Ugo Merlich has also contributed significantly. I also have to acknowledge a lot of the groups from the Max Planck, um, <clears throat> who helped us with all the electronics. All right, that's my final slide, and I hope to hear from you if you have any questions. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Professor João Seco uh, could not join us. So if you have any questions, we uh, just we are going to email the questions to Professor João. And um, he, he will uh, answer the questions by email. Um, okay, so now we move for the next presentations. Yes, that's uh, correct. I was not the microphone uh, on, sorry. Thank you, Caramelo. We go now to have the presentations of UT Austin Portugal, Portugal projects. And firstly, we will we have the project <coughs> presented by Dr. Um, Joana Dias. Uh, Dr. Joana Dias is a current associated professor uh, with habilitation at the Faculty of Economics, University of Coimbra. I don't know if you are here, me. Um, she yes, I am. At UNESCO Coimbra. Uh, as a researcher, she is focused on combinatory optimization and optimization algorithms, but also on data mining and applications of uh, operations research. Today, <coughs> Professor Joana uh, Dias will speak about the project AT and PT automatic treatment uh, planning for proton therapy. Uh, investigations on robustly optimized intensity modulated proton therapy incorporating LET and ABE criteria and physical and biological uncertainties. Thank you, Dr. Joana. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for this invitation to be here presenting this project. So this was a project that we have been carried out carried with the um, MD Anderson Cancer Center. So I am the P from the Portuguese side, Professor Mohan is the PI from the uh, Austin side. Uh, 
And we also have other team members, both in Portugal and in Texas. And we were fortunate enough to also welcome some students. So in MD Anderson Cancer Center, we also have a PhD student, and we also have here in Portugal, in Portugal a master student working with us in this project. So what was the core challenge of this project? As you have been probably talking about during this, these days in this course, um, radiotherapy treatment planning is still a very demanding process, a trial and error procedure. And what we want in very uh, broad terms is to be able to create tools that can support this treatment planning procedure. So what we want is to try to create models, algorithms that at the end can automate this process. So it can release the human planner from this very demanding trial and error procedure. We have focused our attention in the treatment planning of proton therapy. And we basically have an interdisciplinary point of view regarding this problem. So in our team, we have research members from very different scientific backgrounds, medical physics, computer science, operations research, and medical oncology. And basically what we want is to marry all these disciplines together so that we can contribute and make better treatment plans and uh, make this all this procedure of treatment planning um, more straightforward. So why is this problem a challenging problem? Basically, they, there are many, many decisions that have to be uh, made. And uh, we have before worked with IMRT treatment planning, but proton therapy brings new uh, um, challenges to this uh, uh, treatment planning uh, optimization uh, problem. You have just heard about range uncertainties. And so uncertainty is one major issue with proton therapy treatment planning. So what we aim is to develop what we call robust mathematical models and algorithms. So we want to be able to calculate treatment plans that are good, in a number of different situations. So they are robust. They can work well, even under uncertainty. And from a mathematical point of view, we end up with having mathematical optimization models that are really demanding from a computational point of view. Many times they are nonlinear, they are non-convex. And so we have a, broad, uh, a large number of uh, challenges that we have to tackle simultaneously. So what are the decisions that have to be made? We have to decide on the angle of the patient that is lying on the couch. We have to decide on the number of radiation incidences, what these angles are going to be. And also we have to modulate the radiation intensity. So all these decisions have to be made by the, the, the treatment planner. We have just heard about RecPIC, so I will not uh, uh, spend much time on this, but actually we have to take care of uncertainties regarding this RecPIC because one of the main advantages of proton therapy is being very precise. If we can control where this RecPIC is, so if we can in, uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, a way um, align our uh, CTV with the RecPIC, we will uh, be doing a great job, but there are many uncertainties. So range uncertainties and also movement of the structures of interest, the problems with weather feeling, for instance, in prostate cancer. I will not uh, uh, repeat what you have just heard in the, in the previous uh, presentation. So what we want is to take care of all these uncertainties and build robust treatment plans. If we don't take into account these uncertainties, Sometimes we think that we are hitting the targets, the tumor, but we are not because the tumor is not exactly where we thought it would be. And worst case, we can even be targeting an organ at risk instead of targeting the tumor if we don't take into consideration uncertainties. So it's like having a very precise uh, uh, weapon, but having a moving target. So we have to take into account these uncertainties if we want to have robust treatment plans. 
So what have we been doing in the last more or less 15 months? We have uh, begun by developing a totally automatic, robust fluence map optimization approach. So when I talk about totally automatic, I want to say that we don't need the planner to have any kind of intervention during the process of fluence map optimization. And our idea was to create some artificial structures. So we basically consider more structures than the original structures that we have delineated in the CT. And these additional auxiliary structures will somehow be an image of the uncertainties of the possible extreme scenarios that we can be, um, that we, we should consider in practice. The problem with this approach is that we increase immensely the number of structures that we have to take into account when we are planning the treatment. So it is not possible at all to have a human planner determining weights, lower, upper bounds in a trial and error procedure, because we will probably be multiplying by 15 the number of existing structures. So what we have decided to do was to create a very simple mathematical op optimization model, a quadratic op um, uh, optimization model, where we calculate the total dose deposited in each one of the volumes of interest. We have lower and upper bounds associated with each one of the structures. We also have weights, but the parameters, namely weights and lower and upper bounds are calculated in an automatic way by our procedure. So we don't need the human planner in a trial and error process to determine these parameters. And how is this done? This is done by resorting to fuzzy inference systems. Fuzzy inference systems is one way of trying to represent in a mathematical way some very simple rules that we can uh, that we can describe in natural language but we can from this description in natural language we can transform this into a mathematical representation for instance most of the time what the human planners do when they are tackling this problem in this trial and error procedure is looking at how far they are from what they want to achieve and if they are really far from what they want to achieve, then they have to change in a very significant way some of the parameters of those structures of interest. For instance, if they are not being able to spare the spinal cord, then what they do, they increase the importance of the spinal cord into the optimization procedure, for instance, increasing the weight of this structure. If they are really near what they want to achieve, so if they are not there, but they are really, really almost achieving what they want, they only slight change, slightly change these parameters. And what we have done was looking at this behavior from human planners and basically translate this reasoning, translate this trial and error process into a set of fuzzy rules. And then we can use fuzzy inference systems that basically what they do is to imitate the behavior of the human planner, but not require, requiring the human planner to be in front of the TPS and making these changes by themselves. So it is an automatic algorithm that in an iterative way changes all these parameters until an acceptable treatment plan is found. The uh, um, difference here, because we want to find robust treatment plans, is that instead of only considering the original structures of interest that were delineated in the CT, we basically explode this number of structures by artificially creating other structures that consider different scenarios, different uh, possibilities that consider shifts in all the directions for these um, structures of interest. Whenever we have uncertainty, looking only at what is being uh, considered in terms, for instance, of those metrics for the original structures of interest is not a good measure of the quality of the treatments. Why? 
if we have uncertainty, the best thing that we can do to understand if our treatment plan is or is not uh, admissible is to simulate those uncertainties, is to simulate what is happening. So what we also did was to implement a Monte Carlo simulation for assessment of all the treatment plans that we have been creating with this automate, automated procedure. So what we also take into account is treatment fractionation, because actually the fact that the treatment is being given by uh, during several fractions, during several days, will have an impact on the impact of the uncertainties. So what we did was uh, to, to implement this Monte Carlo simulation process, where we have a case, we have a medical prescription, we have a treatment plan, and we see what is going to happen considering fractionation and basically simulating that treatment for 100, 200 times, and then have a set of statistical measures that allow us to see whether our treatment plan is or is not a robust treatment plan, is or is not behaving well under very different um, uh, situations. This means that when we look at many of the tools that are usually used to assess the treatment, uh, the quality treatment, for instance, if we look at the dose volume histogram, we will no longer have one single line for each one of the volumes of interest. If you have a simulation, if you, if you, if you simulate the treatment of one patient 100 or 200 times, then you will have 100 or 200 lines for each one of the structures of interest in this DVH. And this gives us an idea of the robustness of our treatment plan, and we can be sure if there are or are not situations under which our treatment plan is not complying with the medical prescription and is not able to do what we want the treatment to do. The, this project has already ended, but actually we have continued working together. And now, as we have already this totally automated fluence map optimization engine, we are now looking at robust Bimangle optimization. And it was uh, very interesting to look at the previous presentation where uh, Jean Seku showed the, the difference between uh, making a, a change on the angles in terms of, of uh, prostate cancer, for instance, what we are now seeing, and we are exactly working at the present moment with, uh, with prostate cancer, is if we can find out better beams that also contribute to the robustness of the treatment plans. So we are incorporating this automatic way of calculating the, the fluence maps. We have this engine, it's totally automated. So we now are including this in a beam angle optimization and we will try to see whether choosing the angles in a different way than what is usually done in clinical practice can or cannot um, uh, contribute to this idea of a robust treatment plan. And we are also trying to take into consideration in an explicit way, different models for a variable RBE and see whether this has an impact and see whether this can also be integrated into this idea of robust treatment plan. What have we uh, been able to achieve in terms of deliverables uh, by now? Um, this was a very uh, short uh, research project, so it, uh, it lasted for uh, 15 months only. And we also suffered the impact of the, of the, the pandemic period. Um, we were able to, to publish a book chapter. We have one paper also accepted in physics and medicine and biology, where we discuss what we think can be the contributions of the mangle uh, optimization in proton therapy. We also have two more uh, publications being prepared regarding this idea of robust once map optimization and also the robust choice of uh, beam angles. We also have uh, the opportunity, as I told in the beginning, of involving young researchers, and this is really very good 
because we see young people uh, being educated into an, a scientific environment and it was very good for us to be able to collaborate with this team from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. We have never met in person because of the pandemic, but we were able to have a very, very good and fruitful uh, collaboration. Uh, we have participated in some conferences. Actually, our plans, because we don't have a proton center facility yet in Portugal, in Portugal so one of our plans when we prepare, prepared the, the project was to be able to visit the center in, in MDA, but it, this, this was not possible because of the, of the pandemic period. But uh, still, we were able to visit a proton center in Sweden, what was very, very important for us, because one thing is to see some videos, read some things. Another thing is to go into a clinic and see how things are being done in practice. And actually, we only had experiences with IMRT treatment planning and proton therapy. We need a, a new way of thinking uh, of things. So I uh, truly thank this program for having given us the opportunity to, to visit this proton center. And we were also able to, um, to collaborate in this on online course that took place uh, uh, last year. What was the importance of this program? A huge importance. So we would not be able to, to work in proton therapy treatment planning if it was not for, for, this, for this program, because it was uh, crucial to have the collaboration with people that have clinical experience and that are leading experts uh, in this field. So uh, um, I thank the program for giving us this, this opportunity. And actually, as I told you, the, the project has formally ended, but we are still collaborating. And I think that this has opened the doors uh, to many other uh, possibilities and future collaboration works. Thank you so much for your attention. So this was just a very short overview of this, of this project and the, of what we have been doing. And if you have any questions, it will be my pleasure to, to answer to them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Joana. It was a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. And in fact, without uh, collaboration for us, it is impossible to work in this area, is it? And at, at least until now. Uh, uh, <laughs> we hope that <laughs> we have that opportunity um, in next uh, years, <laughs> we hope. <laughs> um, we have no um, questions, uh, neither in the chat, neither in the Q&A. Uh, perhaps we can uh, wait for the next presentation and in the end we'll discuss all together. Uh, but it is, uh, it is okay to, uh, uh, okay to, to, to you. Uh, so um, we go now to move to Professor uh, Stefan Tavernier, presented the project of PET for positron therapy. Professor Tavernier is a full professor in the, I don't know, Firmin, University of Brussels. Uh, with more than 30 years of uh, uh, academic and research experience, Professor Stefan Tervier is uh, especially interested in the area of nuclear instrumentation, including instrumentation for nuclear medicine. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Stefan. It was also a pleasure to have you here. You have now the microphones for you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for giving, for inviting me for this talk. And I should share my uh, thing. So let's do that. So, so you should see that. Do you see my screen? I presume you do. Right? Yes, you can see. Yes, okay, yes. very good. So um, it's not in presentation mode. Uh, yes, it's not in presentation mode. And now I am in presentation mode. Yes, perfect. yes. So, um, so the talk is about proton range verification in proton therapy using PET. And uh, the, the summary really is uh, quite simple. Uh, the UT Austin Portugal program approved a project in beam uh, time of light positron emission tomography for proton radiation therapy. And I will uh, review the motivation and the status of the project. 
Um, now, the motivation is something that by now you should uh, be familiar with. And um, the first of all is, of course, um, the reason why we go to proton therapy instead of uh, gamma rays. I think you've heard um, many times of that and, and don't need to dwell on that any longer. Uh, and of course, proton therapy is, is much more expensive, uh, but there are uh, certain, certain cases where the expense is justified, and that's why in Portugal they will soon have such a system. Um, now, you've also heard about uh, one of the problems in proton therapy, which is that the, uh, there is um, an uncertainty on the proton range, and maybe could explain in a, in a few words the, the basic reason of that uncertainty, then that is that um, basically your treatment is based on the CT image, and the CT image is the, the, the you, me you, you measure the stopping power of, of the, the structure of your patient uh, to, to gamma rays. Uh, that, that's not the same as how much the same tissue uh, slows down protons. And, and uh, you probably know or, or have known that the stopping of uh, the X-rays is related to the approximately the fourth power of, of Z of the atomic nucleus. So it's mainly dominated by the heavier material, while uh, the stopping of proton has to do with number of electrons. So it's proportional to Z, so it's not the same. And you cannot, from X-ray image, uh, calculate how, how much the, what the stopping power for protons is. Of course, if you knew very exactly the, the composition of each uh, cubic centimeter of tissue, you could calculate it. But you don't know that composition completely exactly. You know, of course, approximately, but uh, not exactly. It's just to give one example is, uh, for example, a tissue could contain more or less water. Uh, mainly, it, the tissue had been irradiated in a previous session, so that, that it contains more water or less water than it would have otherwise, and this is an error that uh, will be there and that uh, you have somehow to deal with. Um, so, it, now, if you want to do that, so basically there are, well, there are several ways, but the, the, I would say the most obvious way is to use prone gammas, and you've heard about it. Um, but there is another way, and that, as far as I know, prone gammas is the only method that is really being used with patient. But there is another rather obvious method to try and do it, is to use a positron uh, emission, uh, because the, the, gam, the, the protons, as they travel in the patient, they introduce some nuclear reactions, and in those nuclear reactions, they can produce uh, gammas, uh, but they will also produce isotopes that will emit the positrons, and then you can localize those atoms using the principle of positron emission tomography. You certainly all know what it is, so that's another way of doing it. There are even other ways. So there are some prompt charged particles, there are some neutrons that are, uh, can be emitted. Um, now, those other methods are sort of, um, well, they look a bit more complicated. I'm not saying they are not, not good, but at least uh, I would say the first thing alternative to look at compared to prompt gamma rays would uh, be uh, positron emission tomography. And really the aim of this project is to try and see if PET would be better than a uh, prong gammas or not. Um, so, hold on, why is it doing something strange? Yeah, okay, so, oh no, there's something not right, yeah, okay. So, uh, just in one slide, I quickly remind you uh, what you do when you uh, use uh, prong gammas. Uh, to determine the proton range. So you have a beam that goes in the patient and then the, the, the protons introduce nuclear reactors which emit prompt gammas. Now, the word prompt really means, refers to the fact that those gammas are emitted within nanosecond of the beam passing. Um, and uh, the, 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 the range, these are typically fairly high energy gamma rays, a few MeV, and you show you here a spectrum obtained from a simulation. 
and and to it's not so easy actually to uh, detect and, and localize the direction of gamma rays of that energy and and the way to do it is is to use a collimator and that's basically a big slab of of tungsten typically would be lead but i think it's more often tungsten and have a small opening and then some wedge structure and and so the this this heavy material stops all those gammas uh, and uh, behind that you have a detector for the gammas and you uh, so can determine the intersection of this line with the beam line and so you can see where the beam uh, stops now if you uh, use uh, positron emit uh, positron emission tomography you use the fact that the beam also produce some positron emitters and the most important one in practice are uh, carbon 11 which has a 20 minute decay time and oxygen 15 it has a two minute decay time um, now there are about three times more carbon 11s uh, but because the decay time is much longer and uh, you will not uh, irradiate the patient and then wait half an hour to see all the decays you will of course only be interested in the decays that happen relatively short time which means that in practice oxygen for 15 although uh, there are less of them they, you will there will be more that will uh, probably be detected now, so what I should stress here, a big difference with prom gammas is the prom gammas are pumped, they are immediate, while those uh, positron emitters are detected uh, after a certain time, and you have to wait a certain time to see them. Uh, that's uh, essential. Um, now, uh, you probably know something about PET, so you basically have a, a ring or more or less ring-like detector around the patient. Now, usually PET scan is a full ring, but that's a bit difficult in this setting uh, because, uh, well, you have the beam and those beam actually uh, leave to have an opening for the beam. So it will not be a full ring, but it will be a large part of a ring. Um, now, there are some advantages to PET, and I want to briefly uh, mention those. Um, one advantage is the solid angle, right? In so the the, the problem gammas and, and, and the PET annihilation gammas, they are, of course, emitted in all directions. Um, and in PET, you can uh, have a substantial fraction of the solid angle can be caught. While in, uh, in problem gamma, actually, your solid angle is extremely small. You just have this collimator and a small gap, and, and there will be a very small fraction of uh, the, uh, of the, of the gammas uh, that you will detect. Of course, there are more gammas. Uh, and then you detect them all, where for PET you have to wait. But uh, if you look at it, possibly you will find out that with PET you have more sensitivity. For more sensitivity means that you will need less protons to uh, determine the range. Again, that has to be seen if that is, is possible. Um, of course, uh, I need to point out something about the timing. Uh, the, uh, the positrons are emitted after a certain time, and uh, the, 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 there is one problem already is that uh, by prom gammas, we know that you can do it while the beam is on for PET. Um, when the beam is on, there will be all sorts of background, and it is not yet 100% sure if you can really uh, get a good PET image while the beam is on. That is one of the things we want to study in this project and, and, and see if that is possible or not. But even if that would be impossible, that doesn't mean PET is impossible because the beam is not always on. For example, in um, at MD Anderson, where they have a cyclotron, and the cyclotron has a time structure that typically you have to re-accelerate the, the, the protons that takes about two seconds and then you irradiate typically a few seconds. So anyway, about 50% of the time, the beam is, is not there. So there is no problem. Also, while you are irradiating, you are moving the magnets to scan uh, the, 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 the area in the patient. So that also periods that, that the beam is off. So, there is quite some fraction of the time there is anyway no beam. Uh, so that would not necessarily be a killer 
um, but it's certainly one aspect. Uh, another thing that maybe I do not know if that is realistic in an irradiation, but you could irradiate and then wait, for example, uh, one minute sometime that would be maybe acceptable in the, in the treatment plan to be not have enough uh, uh, PET annihilation events to determine the, the beam position. Now, one thing that I need to, to mention here is that uh, the PET image, uh, the, those positron emitted isotopes, they, they are produced, but they, they, they live a fairly long time and you have a living tissue, so they may move. And that's a consideration that you should bear in mind that uh, that aspect. Um, now, I think, um, yeah, OK. So now I'm get, getting to the uh, uh, the TPBT project. I Sorry, uh, here, I, here you see uh, the list of the collaborators, so basically a team in Portugal and a team at MD Anderson. And, and the aim is, sorry, the aim is that to build a PET system that um, is a, piston, a realistic system, system that really could be used in, uh, in the, for, for proton uh, irradiation uh, and test it. Uh, we will test it with phantoms and possibly animals at the proton irradiation at MD Anderson. And uh, we will compare that with a detailed simulation. Uh, what is not part of the project is to really do patient irradiation. The aim is to take data and compare with simulations and convince ourselves that indeed this has real advantages compared to using prom gammas and then go to the next phase where this detector would really be used for patient if we are convinced that it is uh, worth to do so. So um, I here and in, in basically in, in two pictures, I uh, show you uh, what we will do. So we have uh, to the left, you see a drawing of the, the situation as the detector will be at the proton facility in, in Austin. So we built uh, a PET detector, which you can see here. It's two, uh, a bit more than uh, one, two times one quarter, a bit more than two times one quarter of the PET detector. And uh, the beam would coming from above. Uh, now, if you would use this for a real patient, this would be able, necessarily should have to rotate this, of course. Since we are not planning to do any real patient treatment, this rotation facility is not there. Uh, and we have built a relatively small detector, uh, assuming that uh, we would use it for uh, uh, brain irradiation treatments. Uh, uh, because if you would do uh, with the body, you would need a bigger detector, which would be more expensive and would not learn us more. And to the right, you see the detectors as they are now. Uh, of course, the detectors there, uh, uh, normally they are covered in and closed, and, and you don't see the internal structure. So I show you a picture of the detectors so when you have removed external covers and the cabling uh, so that you can see how it looks like. Um, so basically, the detectors are there and exist. Uh, to show you a little bit more detail about the detectors, uh, not too technical detail, I think that's not needed here. So to the right, you see the basic detector element, right? And this is a um, race of uh, scintillators, LOISO scintillators, and uh, when uh, the 5 and 11 keV uh, interacts in such a scintillating crystal, it produces a light flash. And that light flash is detected with a silicon photomultiplier tube, which is a, a very sensitive photon detector that can detect relatively low levels of, uh, of photons because scintillation light is still not a lot of light, um, so you need that. And so you, you glue this array of crystals to this array of photodetectors. And then if a, a 5 and 11 kV gamma interacts in some crystal, you get the light plot and then the electronics find out that there was an interaction there. And to the left, <laughs> you see um, the detector uh, as it is uh, assembled. Uh, 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 and so you can see these white things in, in, in front are uh, 
those scintillator arrays wrapped in white Teflon uh, to correct the, the type. And then on the back of it, you have the readout electronics and uh, the cooling. Uh, here you have a, a somewhat more uh, technical detail showing how what is the structure. So the the opening, the physical opening is uh, uh, 30, 33 and a half centimeters. So that should be enough uh, for uh, the head of, of a patient. And, um, and you see more or less the dimensions of the whole thing. Um, so um, to summarize uh, the situation, um, we have built the detectors, they are there and finished, and then they basically work. Um, and we have done, you are now in the phase of commissioning that is fully testing the detectors and make sure that they really work on all aspects and as they should be and properly calibrated and so on. And so I will just show you. Now, this is happened only recently that the detectors are ready. So we only have some first measurements, some measurements on time resolution, some measurements on energy resolution, and some very first uh, reconstructed images. So um, this is a plot of time resolutions. Now, what you see there, in so you we put a, a line source, I mean, 68 line source in the middle of the scanner. And then you look at all crystal pairs uh, where you have one gamma. So when, uh, well, gamma arriving within a very small time window um, on those two detectors. So we have uh, uh, several thousand of such uh, pairs, possibilities. And for each pair, you can uh, have a time resolution because the source was in the middle. So only the measurement error makes that the time difference more than zero. Uh, is slightly different from zero, and you have um, a full width of maximum time resolution for all those pairs. And there you have you plot the number of uh, pairs that have a given time resolution, and you see that is about uh, 230 picosecond full width of maximum time resolution, which is a fairly good number, which is sort of the state of the art in PET scanners today, the best one can do in realistic PET scanners today. And there is probably still some room to improve a little bit, but uh, not that much. The other thing I want to show is a pulse height spectrum. So, so this pulse height spectrum, so the pulse height spectrum is you have a, a gamma source, in, in this case, sodium-22. And sodium-22 uh, is a, a positron emitter, so you have 5 and 11 kV gamma rays, but it also emits gamma rays of um, uh, 1275 kV, there you have the two gamma rays. And here you, you if your gamma interacts, you have a light flash and you, you plot in this plot the, the amplitude of this light flash. And so what you see here is the spectrum that you obtain in just one, one such detector. And so the, the big peak in the center there is the, the cases where the 5 and 11 KV gamma deposits all its energy in this um, in this crystal, and you get uh, this one. Um, of course, it happens, and it happens fairly often, that the gamma only undergoes a Compton scattering in the crystal, and then the rest escapes, and only part of the energy is deposited there. And this gives rise to the structure to the left, which is this um, Compton edge, and that is well known. That is the thing you have. So that are events where there was probably a 5 and 11 kV gamma, but it has not deposited all of its energy. And those events, you probably cannot use them because then it could be events that have scattered in the patient. So you don't, you don't know. But if, if you are at the 5 and 11 kV peak, then most probably the gamma has not scattered in the patient. So you can really trust those events. Now notice the the to the very right, the peak of 1275 kV, and it has the same structure, a peak and then the, the Compton edge. Um, but you will notice that it is not linear. I mean, uh, this is 511 and this is 1275, and that's not, uh, not at all on the scale. The scale is not linear. Now, this is um, uh, inherent to the technique. Those photon detectors, sil silicon uh, photomultipliers, they have a saturation effect. So when the, there is more light, 
the saturate and the response of those detectors is not linear. That is just intrinsic to the technique. And you have to be uh, aware of that, but that you can calibrate that. There are uh, several techniques. So this calibration are not yet done, but that is possible to do. Um, and so this plot then is um, a plot of the energy resolution. So energy resolution, that means the, the width, full width of maximum of this peak that corresponds to 511. So you, you have taken a larger number of crystals have and that's the same measurements that was used for the time resolution. So you have all those interactions in the crystals and you can look at all those peaks for the uh, uh, 511 kV and determine the width of that. And from that you determine an energy resolution full width of maximum. And you have a plot of uh, all those values and uh, the average um, energy resolution that you find is 6.5%. Uh, now beware that this is not the true energy resolution because this non-linearity that you have seen the previous plot means that there this is not linear. So in fact, the true energy resolution is, is not uh, 6.5 uh, MeV, but is, is much uh, larger. It's probably more like 12% uh, percent instead of 6%. But again, this is perfectly normal and understood. And uh, that is, uh, what it and that again is a typical number for a good patch scanner, so that also seems to work. Um, and we have uh, some very preliminary measure uh, image reconstruction. This is really uh, obtained in the last uh, week or so, and then suddenly much more work to do to get it better. But uh, so this is a you have the same line source that was used in the measurement. Um, and uh, we have uh, recorded data and made an image. And here you can see uh, the image, uh, the first, I think actually it was the first image we, uh, we obtained about a week ago. And you see the three projections are the same line source seeing from, from three directions. And in one direction, of course, you see just a point. And the two other directions, you see this line. And um, now, if you look carefully, you see that uh, the activity over the line source is not constant. It, it, it moves, but this has to do with normalization errors that have not yet been implemented. So there is uh, nothing strange about that, but to just illustrate that there are still a number of things we need to do before we can say this fully works. But what we can say is that hardware uh, basically works, and there is no reasonable doubt about that. Um, now, in addition to uh, um, building uh, the detector, which uh, is now basically done, we have also set up a whole program of setting up simulations, simulations of uh, of the beam, of the proton beam uh, in, in the target, and, and the production of the positron emitting isotopes and a simulation of the response of the detector to this beam. And here you see a, a, a result. Actually, this was not uh, our calculation, but we have a, we are actually doing a very similar calculation and are close to having the same. So here what you see is uh, the production of um, um, oxygen 15, carbon 11, and actually there's also nitrogen 13, but we do not plan to use that. Uh, and to compare that with uh, the radiation dose deposited by the uh, protons. So you see the red line is the radiation dose deposited by the protons. And the blue and the green line are the uh, uh, number of uh, positron emitting isotopes produced. And what you notice, of course, is that the, the Bragg peak, uh, where you have the maximum radiation dose, is displaced in this case by about seven millimeter compared to, to the maximum of the uh, positron emitting production. But that is a correction that you can know from simulation. And so you, you will measure, of course, uh, what is the proton emission, and then you will derive from that the range using this simulated uh, correction. Now, it may be interesting to compare this to what you have uh, with POM gammas. Uh, if you make a similar simulation for POM gammas, here is what you will get. So again, the red line is the, the, the dose deposited by uh, 
the protons and showing the, uh, the, the, the black peak. And the blue line is uh, what you would observe uh, as from gammas uh, with this setup, as I have shown with a collimator. So what you see a few things, so for example, you see a lot of gammas that seem to be produced uh, beyond uh, the endpoint of the beam, but that of course is not real. And uh, that is the effect of the collimate. The collimate is a big piece of iron, but you have gammas that just enter to the edge of it, are deflected and then detected. And uh, they do not necessarily lose a lot of energy. So you cannot really know that. And, and the result is you have those gammas that are there. Um, the, the distance between the, the peak of, of the prom gammas and, and, and the back peak is a little bit larger than in PET, but that's not such a big difference. Uh, but the, the, the slope due to this effect of the calamite is much less steep. Um, so this is another reason why uh, PET uh, would be better. You would, a priori, it looks that you would be able to determine better uh, exactly where the proton beam stops. Okay, so, um, so basically um, the summary and the conclusion is that um, there are several reasons why indeed PET could be a better way than from gammas to monitor uh, the proton range. Uh, uh, of course, has to be proven. And the aim of this project exactly is uh, to build a realistic PET system aim to be for this application determined to proton beam tested at the MD Anderson proton beam therapy centers and, and compare with simulations and, and then um, see if we can conclude that this really is a better way or not. And um, so the detectors are working. We have already much of the simulation tools that are necessary and we expect that we will have our first beam taps soon. And we have uh, still one year to finish the project. And we believe it's realistic to do those tests in one year and hopefully reach some clear and convincing conclusion on what uh, we should uh, reach. And so that is uh, basically what I wanted to mention to you. And of course, I say something that is obvious. This is work is work of a whole team in Portugal and in Austin. And I have just the privilege to present this here, but it's certainly not my own work. It's the work from the whole team that I'm presenting. So thank you. And if there are any questions, so please feel free to ask. Thank you, Professor Stephen. It was, uh, in fact, a very, very nice project. Um, I. I think that there are no questions on the chat neither in, in the Q&A. There are any questions that uh, any person that is uh, in presence want to make? I'm checking here. No, there is no, no questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the, your presentation. It was very nice to have you here and to finalize our um, uh, our course in the part of the theoretical part. And it was a pleasure to have uh, both you here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stephen and Professor Joana, uh, Joana Dias. Um, uh, if I'm going to give some time for any question. No, nothing. Okay, thank you. We go to um, now to move to um, uh, speak with the students and we go to uh, to finish our, our uh, course. I want to thanks to Ute Austin for supporting us with this course of biomedical imaging. Uh, the participation of Ute Austin and the Anderson Cancer Center and German Center, uh, German Cancer Research Center it was very, very important uh, for us. And we hope that we can uh, again have possibility to collaborate uh, in the near, uh, in the, uh, near future. Thank you very much. Uh, I go now to switch to Portuguese, I think. Um, 
para os estudantes, então, que estão inscritos para fazerem uh, avaliação, por favor, uh, nós também temos que, se calhar, nos ligar a esse link, não? Uh, era. Sim, eu já enviei um e-mail com um link para uma reunião à parte, uma, é, um Zoom, é um Zoom meeting, uh, para que possamos reunir uh, uh, nessa, nessa mesma reunião. Então... Muito obrigada a todos. Thank you very much. I don't know how to speak to English again. Thank you very much for all here. Uh, it was, in fact, a great pleasure to um, have this course, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, in next year we have again uh, the same possibility. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Okay.